Welcome everyone. This is Michael Gibbs from Go Cloud Architects, and I'm super excited. I am here with my good friend and one of the best technology leaders I've ever met, Alvin Acosta. I am so happy to have Alvin here. Alvin was the person who helped take me out of engineering roles and get me into leadership roles. Alvin has given me a tremendous amount of guidance. Alvin has coached and mentored uh, so many others for the last few decades. He and I co-mentored people together. We co-mentored people <laughs> separately. And in so many ways, Alvin and I have done so many things together that I am beyond grateful and beyond honored to have him here. Before we begin, and you know, really what we're about here is about building the best tech careers, helping yeah. you find your best tech career paths, whether you're a cloud architect looking for cloud architect career guidance, whether you're looking for tech leadership developments, or finding your best tech careers, we're here. Alvin is a thought leader in the um, in these days, the GPU industry and how to transform organizations with regards to the best uh, data center technologies like video cards. Got lots of experience with storage area networks, lots of experience with storage and an incredible amount of knowledge on um, networking as well. In fact, I met him at Cisco. We were both CCIEs at the time. So that's how technical Alvin gets, but he's a great leader. So if you're looking for AWS mentoring or cloud training or anything to boost your cloud career, we're going to talk about it today. Now, you know, we also may discuss data science topics because they're one of the best tech careers, cloud computing career training, or literally anything else. Now, I'd like to let everybody know about some free thing that we're doing next week because I'm super excited. Next week on October 5th to, through October 10th, for three hours per day, we're going to do a completely free Certified Solution Architect Associate Bootcamp. Now, we're not going to just focus on AWS certification. We're going to have an extra input to getting you cloud hired because it's not just knowing the name of the service and how to configure it. It's more about knowing what the pieces and parts of the architecture work with. So we're going to give you some free AWS certification training, but we're going to make it much bigger and it's going to be completely free. I personally evaluated every single course in the industry and there was no course that I could say that I was actually able to buy that would prepare you to be a cloud architect. So because of this, we're going to run our own and we're going to do it completely free. So today, you know, I'm here with Alvin and I'm super excited about it. Alvin and I have together over 50 years of technology experience. Alvin has guided me everything from Mike, don't reduce yourself to this level, uh, because he saw me at one point arguing with something over somebody, something, some, uh, over something so trivial earlier in my career. And I remember he said it to me, walked me out of a really great Brazilian restaurant. I took a deep breath and said, wow, Alvin's a genius. And I came back and I was totally different. And just that, just that changed things for me. So you're never going to know when you're going to get these precious pearls of wisdom from experts out there like Alvin. Because I know Alvin, I respect Alvin, and he's helped me so much. And I'm sure I've helped Alvin. And at one point, I think we were teeter-tottering each other. He got me into management, and I'd help him with his management thing. He'd help me with my management thing, and we did it for a long time. So anyway. If you're looking for a great technology expert, you're looking for a great coach, it's Alvin DaCosta. So Alvin, I'm so thankful to have you here today. Alvin, right. would you like to talk a little bit about yourself for a couple minutes? I would, thanks Mike. And I really appreciate and honored to be with you. It feels good to be back and talking to you again, Mike. It's been too long. Too um, long. Yeah, too long and it's great to see you again. Um, and so for those of you that are, gonna, um, that are taking this session, hopefully you hit the like button if you like what we have to say here. Um, ultimately what we're trying to do is that um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and story uh, because I think it'll resonate with a lot of you um, that want to build your career in IT and move up the management chain. Uh, I come from very humble beginnings. Um, I was an average student in high school, um, probably around a 3.0 GPA or so, I'm a B student, and um, I ended up going to uh, junior college. Um, I didn't get into any of the UCs that I wanted to go to. And I transferred to junior college. And um, from there, I ended up going to San Jose State. And I actually majored in civil engineering, of all things. And my logic at that time when I was 18 was that as a civil engineer, I'd be able to work in the field and I'll be able to work in the office. So it's kind of a mix of a couple of things. And I didn't want to be behind a desk the whole time. Um, what I soon realized is in 1999, I graduated in 96 and I was working for a company called Brian, Gis Brian Kangas Folk. And one of my first projects actually was to do the San Francisco airport. Um, and I was working as a geotechnical engineer designing the uh, piles that go in for the dirt. 
And at that time, um, I told my friend when we were working, I said the internet was booming. It was 1996. DSL high-speed internet was just getting launched. Um, and then uh, cable modem was going to get ready to come out. And Mike, you probably remember those times, right? I sure do. I remember getting rid of the ISDN phone networks that I had in my house <laughs> and debugging these Q921 and Q931s because uh, the, the digital phone lines we had in the house never worked. Or in the office, we'd spend half of the time, the, uh, the ISDN actually used to be called I Still Don't Know. Yeah. You would have it, but yes, I was with you. And you know, it's funny. I graduated in 1996 too, but I was on the healthcare side. So oh, I yeah. remember those days. Yeah. I remember having 2,400 baud modems and dialing up to things. And then I remember when DSL came and it was amazing. And then I remember doing video over DSL. So Alvin, I remember those days exactly, completely. With yeah. You. And yeah, so what happened is um, I turned to my buddy when we were civil engineers and I said, we got to figure out a way to get into tech. And um, because all of our friends were doing really well, um, double the salary we were making. And so what we, what we did is we decided to um, call a few friends and try to get into the business. And we did that. We started, another friend of mine and I started our careers in tech support. And what we did at the time is to build credibility because we didn't have any background, we had to take certification classes. So mm -hmm. I took my very first CCNA class. Um, I read the book and I passed it. And I went in for the interview and I got the job, right? And then I learned and built my way through that. I, 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 I started off at Pacific Bell Internet. From there, I went to Excited Home. I started working on backbone routing uh, with BGP, uh, complex routing within tier one routing within... Um, with, it, with Cisco routers and Redback networks, as you probably remember some of them with the DSL. All of them. Yeah, I mean, of course you do, yeah. So we <laughs> were doing a lot of that tier one routing. Um, and then from there, I kept working up my certification. So I went to get my CCNP at the time, and then I did a CCDA and a DP, um, and I got those certified. And then I, then I got a call from a recruiter to come to Cisco. And when I went to Cisco, I started off as a pre-sales engineer. They call it systems engineering number one. Um, and I started off doing that in the channel. And um, I eventually progressed my career through the various levels of system engineering that I made uh, SE manager. And that's when I had the privilege of meeting Mike for the very first time. And I remember still meeting you, Mike, and I looked at your resume and I said, wait a second, this guy has a CCIE, this guy has a health background, he has uh, everything that I was looking for, plus you worked on the global accounts in New York. I said, I got to get this guy. <laughs> And so I ended up hiring Mike. We had a great conversation. And it sure was did. And so, go ahead, Mike, you say something. I was just thinking, I remembered it like it was yesterday because I spoke to Alvin and I was like, who is this guy? I really like this guy. Wait, the channel? The channel? I'm in the global team. And I was like, he's like, you can live in Florida. And I was like, what I didn't know was how much fun. And I, that was the first time I closed a billion dollar deal in my life working with one of those large global partners we had. Um, for which the sales rep that day proceeded to tell on a call that he never, that I never showed up for the meeting. And you were like, wait, Mike was in that meeting. Um, I actually signed his travel expenses. So I remember that meeting and I remember all the fun times that we had together and all those trips and all those lessons learned. So yes, I remember joining that channel and loving it. So that's Alonzo Coleman. He's a cloud architect, one of my students, so good that he's gonna help me teach that boot camp next week. He's gonna be doing all the demonstration. <laughs> I mean, as you know, architects, we're not exactly, you know, being hands on other than design, but you know what? He's still good at that. So he's going to do it. So I remember those days. I remember when you first got back from that first vacation that you were first on. I remember all those trips we did. I remember all those executive briefings. I remember those demand generation events. And I remember some of those things you taught me. And, you know, I still think about them 20 some years later. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll tell you guys, so what happens is that that was my very first opportunity to become a manager. And so the first thing that I had to think about in my career was where did I want to go? So like I, I, I've reached uh, the point when I, when I hit an SE3, which was kind of a senior SE, mm -hmm. um, I won multiple awards uh, for productivity and for efficiency, et cetera. The next question was, is where do I go in my career? And there was two paths you could choose. You could stay to be an individual contributor and move up to technical solution architect, or you could decide to go to become a manager. And so when I sat down and I thought about this, the reason why I chose manager is because I felt I was groomed from the very bottom up, meaning I started in tech support. 
and I worked tech support one, two, three. Then I went to implementation engineering. Then I went to pre-sales engineering one, two. So I've learned so much at that point in my career that I felt I could give back to people and I could be a mentor and help people grow. In addition to that, I'm more of a people's person, right? I'm really good at dealing with the politics, understanding what needs to get done, how to, how to get money, how to evangelize for my team. And so that's one of the reasons why I chose to move into management. And so I did that and I, I did uh, the SC manager role. Um, I did the globals for the first second, uh, for a couple of years. And then I was asked um, by our senior leadership at Cisco to start the data center channel. And there was nobody hired on the team. As a matter of fact, we had one product at the time. And I was really worried that um, they were putting me in a place where I wasn't going to be successful. But it turned out to be great. I hired 15 people in six months. Um, we ended up acquiring a couple of companies. And I ran the whole data center uh, SE organization for North America. And um, at that time, um, that year, I was awarded top leader uh, for the Americas by Chuck Robbins, who's now the CEO. Uh, back then, he was the worldwide um, vice president for channels. I and, uh, yeah, and at that time, when I won the award, I, you know, you've reached another place where you got to make a decision, right? Of what do you do? Like now, I'm a manager. I've done all the technical stuff. I've reached the the peak of my career. I could either go to the right and stay on that, go to become a, a senior systems engineering manager and possibly a system engineering director, or I could pivot and move to the sales consultant and strategy side. And, and that's what I did. I decided to move into the worldwide channel strategy side, where it's more business focused. And what I, what my job was is to run the data center programs, incentives, rebates, strategy for uh, new product introductions, all of those type of things, and try to really ramp up the channel and um, so then I, I decided to do that for a few years. And then I said to myself, you know, I was doing a really good job there, won a couple of awards there. And then I thought to myself, gosh, what's next? And the one thing, Mike, I never thought of was a startup. So I said, why not? So let me try. I said, I, I did well enough in my career. So I decided to do a startup. So I, I signed with Nimble Storage. They were a pre-IPO um, uh, company. And I was very excited to do it. And I was the first person hired in channels um, to, to build out the whole global strategy. And so I, I, when I first got there, I remember looking at the partners and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, who are these partners? What am I going to do with these partners? I never even heard of them. And I've, I've been in channels for 20, uh, for close to 15 years at that point. And uh, what I realized is I told our CEO at the time, I said, guys, we have a fundamental problem. We can't, we can't do any type of forecasting because our deals are just going deal by deal. There's no type of business planning process in place. And so what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, focusing on a small subset of channel partners and we started doing business planning processes, hiring PBMs that could manage the accounts, et cetera. And then from there, after Nimble, we went public uh, we grew the business and then we sold to HPE. And I decided to take a look at whether other opportunities were out there. NVIDIA was there and I decided to join NVIDIA. And one of the reasons why I decided to join NVIDIA, um, at first I didn't know what it was. At first I was thinking, oh, this is a graphics company. What am I gonna do for a graphics company? Um, but when you peel back the onion, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of stuff we're doing in the enterprise. Um, we work with artificial intelligence, a subset of that machine, machine learning. Um, we're looking at automating uh, a lot of the processes. And so what I run is I run the global strategy now uh, for an NVIDIA. I dotted line all the channel sales people report to me. I have the operations team, the global systems integration team, as well as the OEM acceleration team. So I have a lot of different uh, organizations. And... Um, it's really been rewarding to be on this side. And you know what excites me, Mike, about what you're doing um, with uh, Glo Go Cloud Architects is the fact uh, that you're focusing on the cloud, number one. Number two, you and I have talked about your expansion into data science, right, and machine learning, uh, which is really important because when you guys think about it, there's been three industrial revolutions that we've had. One was the steam engine. When it was when it was first designed, it was the first one. The second one was electrical power for mass production. The third one was electronics and IT to automate production. And now what they're saying is the fourth one is going to be blurring the boundaries of physical, digital, and biological worlds. And if you think about it, what does that actually mean? That means it's about artificial intelligence. 
that's the next wave of where we're going. And what I want to talk to you guys about, and what's super important when you look at my career, how did all of this happen, right? When I started as a civil engineer and I moved to tech support, there's a there's something called market transitions, which is very important to understand. John Chambers always talks yeah, about yeah. market transitions. The reason Cisco is a multi-billion dollar company is because John knew how to capture market transitions. And market transitions, what does that mean? It means it creates sales opportunity. It could create job opportunity and just opportunities to connect with various people within the industry. So there's a lot of opportunity around market transitions. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of them. When I made the change from uh, civil engineering to tech, the market transition was high-speed internet. Cable modem and DSL was just launched at the time. When I made the transition to Cisco, we were just starting voice. Voice was gonna become free. It was gonna be packets over the internet. And I was able to transition to a voice engineer over at Cisco. Uh, when I look at the market transition of going from uh, to nimble storage, it was all about moving from traditional storage to flash storage, right? And we at our, our solution was hybrid flash and then pure storage had full flash, right? So it's all about capturing market transitions. And now the next wave for all of you is around cloud and AI ML. That's the next market transition. So for those of you guys that are studying, it is absolutely prudent that you understand these market transitions because that's where the job opportunities are gonna be for you. It's exactly what Mike said. I worked, I looked at a few of uh, Mike's videos and he had one on, on recruiters. And um, there was a really good one that you could leverage on recruiting and getting a right recruiter to help you find that right role. Very important point that Mike made. And so I wanna make sure you guys understand market transitions are great opportunities for you to take advantage and get into the next market. Right now, we are definitely in a market transition with AWS, MSFT, Google Cloud. That's one opportunity. And then the second opportunity is AI and ML, right? If you look at like all the AI companies, there's C3 AI out there. There's NVIDIA that's leading the charge with GPUs and software coupled with the GPUs. And those are all super important to do. Aside from all that, guys, what's really important when you want to grow your career is you have to be passionate and you have to have the grit. I'm not a highly educated person, right? I, I mean, I, like I said, I come from very humble beginnings. My father worked for the railroad. My mother was a secretary. Um, they came from, a, from, they were both born in Africa and they came here um, and uh, tried to start a living. And I was born here, but came from very humble backgrounds, but I was always, always passionate about my work and, and putting out high quality work. And so there's two videos I highly recommend that you watch. Um, there's, a, there's a lady named Angela Duckworth, and she does a lot of TED Talks. Um, and one of them is around grit. So if you Google Angela Duckworth and grit, watch that video. The second video you should watch is around passion and perseverance. And that's going to also be a really good video for you to watch. Um, those are what's ultimately going to grow your career. When I wake up every day, I have a notepad that's kind of next to my desk. And one of the things I like to do is I like to take notes of ideas. Sometimes I, for me, I just think of things at night and it's something will pop in my head of like a vision I have. And I'd be able to write it down on a piece of paper so I don't forget it the next morning. And then I act upon that vision. And another thing that I'll mention is when you move in, up the ranks into management, you have to be able to distinguish between leadership and management. A leader is somebody that has a vision, right? You have to have a vision of where you're going in the future. You have to be able to lead the organization. Then comes the strategy. And then as a manager, you have to be able to execute through your teams. And execution means tracking your metrics, assuming that uh, you have all of the data points that you need, and that's what's ultimately going to keep you all synced together. And so, Mike, when I look back at my career, um, these are the critical things that I think have made me successful. Um, in addition to that, I would say mentors are super important. Um, mentors, for me, I've had some of the best mentors, um, and I take tidbits from everybody, right? Because, like, what I've noticed is everyone is different. I had one guy. For example, his name is Anthony uh, Maderos. He works with me. He runs in the operations side. He is extremely detailed on trackers. 
and and making sure you're executing your initiatives and con and confluence and excel sheets and things like this there's another guy um, named anthony that i uh, another anthony that i work with and he's really good at presentations his delivery um, the way he does his uh, hand gestures and everything and so as you build your career you need to latch on to certain people and pick those one or two items from each one of them and build it within yourself and then build yourself up and that's what i've learned and even from you know like when i was working with mike I learned a ton from Mike, right? Even though, you know, Mike reported to me, but, you know, he was a healthcare specialist. I would watch him some of the big healthcare accounts, like at General Electric Healthcare and just listen to him talk and I'd pick up and learn. And those are all nuggets that you have to retain with you and you just get better and better in your career. And so that's how I kind of feel, Mike, with everything is, you know, I think you've done a great job with, with the goal. I think the classes you're focused on are really going to prepare your students for the future. And it's just doing all these extra things like hearing voices from the professionals, getting them aligned with technical recruiters, resume builders, all these types of things are going to help contribute to that success. And thank you, Alvin. And that's what I'm really trying to do. The whole point of the training that I'm trying to do is teach people the actual architecture world, meaning the presentation skills, the executive presence, the CEO, CFO, CISTO relevancy, how to communicate to those visual, auditory, and kinesthetic types. And I try and share the wisdom. Things that you taught me, things I when I when I learned sales, I watched Pat Finn in action when he was our area VP and then he became our SVP. And I watched how he treated his customers. And I watched those ROI models that his team had done. I watched the way he communicated and I watched the way he solved customer problems that, oh my God, that's the way to do it. You yeah. taught me more about channels and channel development. I remember watching others, uh, Frances Dare, you know, she was my partner at Cisco. She used to work as an executive coach. She was an executive coach in Japan like 30 years ago. And then she was the CFO of a hospital. And when I joined, mm -hmm. I remember the first presentation I gave was, Mike, that sounds great. Too many buzzwords, to this, to this. She said, do you mind if I send you a book? And I said, you're my coach, you can send me anything. She sent me a book called Why Business People Speak Like Idiots. And it was about removing all of the jargon and really getting to the point. You were a master of that. She actually showed me that. And instantly, I was no longer stringing buzzwords together. People right. understood me and I was relevant. So I remember that. Now, something you said I want to pick up on. You keep a notebook with you. Yeah. Here's what I do. I have a slightly different variation of the same thing. At night is when I typically think about things. I typically do some yoga, some meditation. I got a thought. Then it's like, okay, Chris, my COO. I call him and leave him a voicemail or I send him a detailed message. And I do it for two reasons. One, as you know me, it'll go in one ear and out the other. But more importantly, he's really smart, really capable, and I trust him. So I've got an idea that, you know, yeah, there he goes. Chris voicemail is my notepad. I don't yeah. really know how I'm going to execute the idea, but it's something I think about at 11 o'clock at night. I send it to Chris, and then I know that by the next day, he's got a plan. Like, I got the vision, but he's got the plan. So, yes. The way you listen and you had mentors and i saw some of your mentors at cisco and i started from humble beginnings too i actually worked two and a half full-time jobs while i was in school yeah. i was a bc student in high school why was I a bc student in high school i worked full-time as an emt i barely made it to class i used to fall asleep in class i think mm -hmm. i missed like 50 year 50 days of my senior year because i was busy <laughs> working so you know i did that worked three jobs you remember the kind of crazy hours i was keeping i was managing this business this business so Grit. Right. When people tell you it can't be done, 10 years ago, I was told I would never walk again or even be yeah. able to sit in a chair. I'm here today. I'm not going to say that it doesn't take me three hours every day to walk down the stairs from the health perspective of physical yeah. therapy, but it doesn't matter. Alvin told you he came, where he came from. I came from the same thing. In martial arts, we say hard work beats talent when talent doesn't try. Yeah. No one can stop you from achieving something. If you want it, if you put your mind, your effort, your heart, your body, and focus into it, you'll win. Yeah. You'll you have win. to want it. You have to have the desire, that grit, as they say, to be successful. Um, and I think, you know, with a lot of people, there was a time in my career I was lost, right? And I didn't know, like, what I wanted to do. I didn't think I was smart enough. And, you know, there was people around me that were CCIEs and they were writing books. And I thought to myself, gosh, I'm an SE and I can't do any of that. And, um, you know, I just slowly plugged away at it, just kept getting one cert after another, and then eventually built my confidence. And, 
for a lot of you out there that are, you know, either struggling to find something or, you know, you're having a difficult time with the test, just keep at it, guys. You know, it's something we all struggle. Everyone struggles in life, right? It's everything we we all have to work through and, and an effort we put through, but eventually it pays off and you'll eventually get it. And you'll and the other thing that's important too is building connections, right? Like look at Mike. Mike has so many connections, right, across the industry. Um, and those actually help him. Like when Mike asked me to do this, I was like, oh, Mike, thank you. I actually thanked him. I said, this is awesome. I love speaking to people. And I'm the and I'm thankful because he's helping you guys. <laughs> yeah. And so you gotta you gotta make sure you also get there, right? Uh, by by building your network of people. Uh, and that's super critical. All these jobs that I've gotten in my career has been because I knew somebody at the company that said, hey, you got to bring Alvin in or, hey, you know, here's a recommendation. Um, and so I highly recommend your network through LinkedIn is one thing that's important. Do the extra mile. Like I'm the type of guy that when I go out and I'll, I'll ask somebody to lunch, I'll say, hey, I'm going to go grab lunch. You want to go and then get to know them. Right. Super important to do that. Um, and that's what ultimately helps to career building. It does. man. you know what? One of the things that Alvin said to me many years ago, he's like, hey, can you meet this kid, Kay? He's like, he might be worth us mentoring. And I remember I meet this kid, we'll call him Kay. And I remember as soon as I met him, there was something about him that I was like, now I know why Alvin wanted me to talk to him. There was an inner fire in him. He had no background. He had been hired as like an associate into the program, but there was something in him that I went, oh my God, that hidden talent, that hidden attitude that Alvin instantly saw that he's like, go Mike, talk to him. See if you see what I see. And I went and met this kid. And I went, oh, my God. I said, what do you want to be? He's like, I'm in this engineering thing, but I want to be on the business side. I said, okay. I said, let's talk. I had him discuss a few things to me. I had him present a few pieces of technology. And he did it like an engineer. He went into deep, deep, deep depth about a small mm -hmm. thing. And I said, okay, let's elevate it. What are you trying to solve? What business problem are you going to solve? How can you assist a business with this tech? I just gave him a problem. And he sat there and he tried and he almost did it on his first shot. And I said, Kay, you're my new student. I said, I'm going to work with you. Alvin's going to work with you. Three months later, he had taken on a massive role called the PSS, which was basically four promotions in a single role. And it was just because he knew how to walk, how to talk. I remember saying to him, I said, look, in this role, you're going to be dealing with people in big organizations that have lots of money to spend. You're going to have to do ROI modeling. You're going to have to look like a business executive, put on a suit. The suit should be blue or black with this color shirt. Make sure this is what you're wearing. This is the IBM, the Wall Street, the Cisco, the Microsoft look. Wear this thing. Walk and talk this way until you can figure out your own style. Two months later, he had an incredible job. So great. later, he learned that he could, uh, um, what do you call it? He looked and he learned that he could learn how to be himself, which is really what the goal was. But we had to get him to speak like a Wall Street person so that when he was with the executives, when he was saying, here's my $30 million security solution, he could convince them that he was the person. He had the executive presence, that gravitas, that emotional intelligence to connect. He did it overnight. He did it overnight. Yeah. So I've been asked by my production team, since I'm not Mr. YouTube, but I love YouTube. If you are enjoying this content, please type cloud hired in the chat box below. So now that I've gone through my mandatory YouTube algorithm, <laughs> things that I'm supposed to do, we can get back to this content. So Alvin, you said certification. Yes. Uh, I both love and hate certifications. And here's the reason I love them. And it looks like you're on mute. What yeah. I love about certifications is they can make up for gaps of experience. Mm -hmm. What I love about certifications is they can show the hiring manager you're serious. What I love about certifications, in some cases, like the CCIE, they can actually teach you a lot. Yes. But really, they get you that interview. Yep. You know, if you interview someone, I know about my failings, if you had a choice between someone that's two years out of school, that has very limited experience, but they're the smartest person you've ever met, with the, and, they're, uh, and you interview them and they're 100% technically competent with a great attitude, energy, enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and you interview someone with 10 years of experience that's not very capable, who do you hire? Yeah, exactly. You want somebody to search, right? Right. You want someone good. So yeah. when I'm looking at certifications, to me, they're an indication that you went to the effort. But, you know, here's where I get scared about certifications, and I like your perspective. Yeah. 
you want to be a Cisco networking guy or girl, CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. Makes Correct. sense. Yeah. CCGP, one of those things along the chain. Where I get scared is now Amazon has 10 or 12 certifications. One for Alexa, one for big data, one for databases, one for developers, one for maintenance or sysops, one for DevOps, one for being a developer. What do you think about getting a resume that has every other skill other than the one you're actually an expert in? Yeah, and you, you know, that's an important thing, right, to understand because there's so many different architectures and technologies out there. Um, you really want to stay focused in the area that you're going after. Um, if you're going after data machine learning or artificial intelligence, you got to stay with the data scientist. The Cisco certification doesn't mean anything in those categories. Uh, for cloud, obviously, the Google, the GCP certs, the AWS certs, those are all uh, relevant for that. And a Cisco cert wouldn't really be relevant in the cloud. Um, so you're exactly right, Mike. We have to, as we go through certifications, make sure we're tailoring our certs according to the jobs we're trying to go after. Exactly. So if we're trying to do cloud network, my developers to be great developers. If I hire a data scientist, it's assumed that they know all those data science tools, the PyTorch, the TensorFlow, the Python scripting, and all those other tools of visualization tools, which you probably know far more about than me. Here's what I know about data science. The first employee I had actually went to a full, you know, long, you know, one of those multi, multi, multi month, all day data science boot camps. I think you're right. I think data science is the future. I think it was the network. The first cloud we worked on was Frame Relay. Then we worked on what, ATM? ATM. Then what was it, the BGP VPNs? And then after that, it was VPLS and all these other things. Now, the stuff that we did, that edge computing, all those data centers that we built, now it's just called the cloud. Nothing's changed. Yeah. It's just that now we're renting it out from somebody else. But now they've got tools. You deal with Google. They're the biggest search engine in the world. Boy, they've got some pretty good machine learning algorithms to do that. But you know what? Google, too. Second largest search engine in the world. Ooh, wait. <laughs> that might be a place that's got some really good libraries, and they've got a whole lot of NVIDIA GPUs that you can do these things on. And ooh. But you know what? Maybe AWS has got some really good infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You're going to use it. And then maybe Azure is the neutral player that you can feel safe with because they don't take a side on anything. And they can give you some of the best business guidance because Microsoft, like Cisco, are good business strategic advisors. So mm -hmm. maybe there's that. And then you get into the niche players like uh, NVIDIA, best chip, one of the best chip makers in the world right now. I've got a collection of Quadro A5000 cards sitting around the house. That's and you know great. what? It's like maybe I need more of them because one <laughs> of these days I'm going to have a data scientist that's going to evaluate all these things on the internet aggregate it, make good inferences, and we're going to be able to reach more lives. And I'm looking for some data scientists to help me with it. I just now I have the stuff, the cards, the gear. Now I just want to find a place to use it. So Alan, right. I agree with you 100 percent Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So when you're new and you're young, and I don't mean young as in tech, but basically it's like you're you're like me one day. One day you're like, I had enough practicing medicine. I'm gonna be a network architect now. Um, there you go, Jesse. He's already working with some NVIDIA gear. Jesse, great, it was Jesse. one of my students. <laughs> Jesse was such a motivated guy and so capable. He's one of those young people like uh, that guy we'll call Kay that you and I said we had to train. Um, yeah. Jesse's going to be joining my team. So because of his energy, enthusiasm and passion um, and work ethic and the things he showed me. So what would you tell new people? How do they spot trends? I know how I spot trends, but how do you spot market trends? So market trends, um, it's it's not always easy, right? You have to look at, um, you know, one thing I pay attention to is I'm an avid stock player. Um, so I'm always looking at stocks. And um, when you watch like uh, CNBC and all of these different uh, shows um, that deal with stocks and read up on the internet, they'll kind of tell you some of the up and coming IPOs, right? And so with IPOs, I typically go read like if it's a tech IPO, what they do and what they're doing. And then I kind of look to say, oh, wow, this is kind of like a new trend that's happening. Um, so it's always good to know. Um, I think this, there's a website and I can't, I think it's called ipocenter.com. But um, if you can look at it, it'll show you all the IPOs that are going to be coming up and then just go read what they do. Go to their website and see what's coming up. Um, and that's how I kind of see what trends are popping up uh, for the most part. There's a time when Pure Storage, Nimble, all those guys were, you know, Nutanix, they were all going at the same time. Now you got all these AI companies that are going at the same time. They all have web addresses, .ai. So you, you kind of know some of those trends that way. I almost took a good leadership position with Nutanix a couple of years ago. 
And then uh, as the position was being made, it was pulled because of COVID. And uh, But I really like their hybrid cloud model. I also like the OpenStack Ansible cloud model. I just like a cloud period. I think that ability to have that agility was just great. You know, at Cisco, we were doing cloud stuff before, you know, it's all new until it's mm -hmm. not. You know, yeah. and that's the thing which I think makes it easy for you and easy for me. We know where the world's going because we've seen the trends. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I like to say is if your fundamentals are really strong, it doesn't matter where you're at. Every time I see a new feature, like constantly there's a new feature. AWS, for example, has a new feature. It's called, e they allow you to route between subnets. Brand new press release a month ago, you can now route in between subnets. Now, that's great. But we did it 30 years ago, Yeah, routing between subnets. So if your fundamentals are good, and look, AWS is an incredible cloud. I mean, I love it. They're amazing. But what you're saying is, first, there was the network in the data center. Then we built up these network in the data centers. Then we started adding cool stuff like AI and machine learning to the data centers, 100 gig Ethernet, super, super low latency NVMe storage and RAID arrays. And now... Everything we built is so fast, we can now share that with others. Mm -hmm. So that's the cloud. It's the same thing we built. We moved it over. Nothing changed, but now it's a new place. So now it's about getting the cloud to catch up with the data center. Now we can route between subnets, for example. Okay, great. Next week, will be there'll be a way to put in more security appliances that are more, the services are more mature, more mature firewalls, more mature load balancers. Sooner or later, all going to be on the cloud and everybody's gonna have this 100 gig or one terabit networking to the cloud, super high-speed connections to the cloud with software-defined networking, and everybody's gonna get access to everything real fast and real cheap. Now, Alvin, I know there were a couple of things that I wanted you to share your experiences on because you've got such a valuable experience, but what would you tell that first person fresh out of school? How do they pick, I mean, I know to tell people, I say, pick what you love. Mm -hmm. I say, really find that one thing that you want to be great at and just master it and be better at it than anybody else. But that's my way. And, you know, I grew up in a ch in challenging environment. I then spent most of my time with a lot of special operations guys and girls, well, mostly guys because they were special operations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those guys were like mental toughness training. I remember I did something called drown proofing one day with my uncle and a couple of other special operations forces guys, because they were going to teach me how to be mentally tough. And here's what they did for 10 minutes straight. They tied my hands, they tied my feet, and they put me in a 15 foot pool. All I could do was pop to the surface, take an inhale, and then exhale, fall to the ground, and then hope to do this. And I had to do this for 15 minutes straight without my hands on my feet. You know what their goal was? Hmm. Their goal was to teach me to become under pressure. Yeah. That first minute, it was scary. I'm like, wait a second, no hands, no feet. I'm 15 feet underwater. This is terrible. What did yeah. I learn? Take a nice deep breath on the top. Exhale slowly on the ground. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And if something is in your way, just keep going. Learn to relax into it. And it's, it's hard. One of the things that I always loved about you as a leader is you were so emotionally keel. There was no bad mood, Alvin. It was, <laughs> Alvin was here. Alvin was in charge. He had the gravitas, he had the presence, and everybody knew you were in charge. You never said a word. I never saw you have to discipline anybody. I just saw, I'm, I'm sure you did privately, but you were just so there. So what's the secret to getting people to want to do their job? Yeah, and that's a great question um, because I asked, actually I got, I get asked that question a lot, actually, believe it or not, Mike. And I think one of the keys is, is um, I had the opportunity to be part of Chuck Robbins' um, leadership team. Um, so when Chuck was doing his leadership meetings, um, I had the opportunity to, to attend a lot of those. Um, and one of the things that Chuck said, and it'll always stick with me, is he says, when you hire people, first of all, he said, people don't leave companies, they leave managers. That's the first thing he said to me, right? The second thing he said is, when you hire somebody, you got to hire somebody that's smarter than you, right? And um, that actually would bother a lot of managers because some managers want to be the best. But what you have to do is when you're building a team, when I build, I hire people that are not only smarter than me, but people that have better backgrounds than I do and diverse backgrounds. Because then what I do, my value add as a manager 
is I could bring all the ideas together, formulate my strategy, run it by everybody, and then implement it, right? And so that's super critical is that as a manager, you have confidence in who you are. Number two, you hire best of breed talent. And the way you recognize best of breed talent is you're going to have the experience of doing it. I was fortunate that I started in tech support and worked my way all the way up the chain because when I interview people, nobody could pull the wool over my eyes because I've done the job. So I actually know how long it takes to do certain things. Um, and so I think that's super important, Mike, is just being able to understand the role well, um, identifying top-notch candidates and caliber people, and don't be um, don't be uh, like worried about them being smarter than you and showing you up. You be the leader that you are. You have certain things that you bring to the table as well. You know, that's really great wisdom from Alvin. I personally aim to be the dumbest of the people I hire. I want everybody to be the smartest person. And at least for me, something Alvin said, diverse backgrounds. Here's what he means by that. Or I'll, I'll let him answer it, but I'm going to tell you how, what I look for. Yep. I look for people that have skills that are different than me. If they have presentation has to happen, I love giving presentations. I don't need that. Although I would because I think everybody should be an expert presenter. But, mm -hmm. you know, I know networking. More specifically, I know BGP, MPLS, and IP multicast, and video. And that's it in networking. Oh, well, healthcare architectures, but that's neither here nor there. But that's the limitation. That's my area of expertise. So when I'm in there, you know, I want someone with, who's got a data science person background on my team. I want someone that's got a software development person on my team. I want someone that's got a big data, database, data aggregation kind of back on my team. I want someone that's got a network background to back me up. I want someone that's got a security background. And you know what? If they don't come from tech, I don't care. I want someone that's got great experience. If I want to delight some customer experience and customer success and customer support, you know, someone that's worked in a field where they've done a lot of customer support and a lot of customer success and customer relationship management, all I have to do is teach them tech. That's easy. That person is an expert. So for me, I want people that care with the right attitude, energy, enthusiasm. I've hired people with no tech background and trained them and they did fine. What I can't replace is attitude. I can't replace energy. I can't replace enthusiasm and I can't replace the inner strength and the mental toughness to do the job. You mentioned what you're looking for in diverse candidates. What are you looking for? So a couple of things, Mike, um, like one thing I never do is I never hire, uh, like, let's say if I'm building a team of four people, I would never hire all four people from Cisco as an example, Perfect. because the leadership is the same. The thought process is the same. Operations processes are the same. What I tend to do is I tend to hire somebody from a large OEM, let's say like Dell. Then I would hire somebody from a small boutique startup, like a nimble storage. Then I'd hire somebody with a software background from like VMware. And then maybe somebody with like a data science background from C3 AI as an example. And then when you do that, and then you're going to get diverse perspectives. Like if we're going to implement a project to do, for example, we have something called opportunity registration, where when a partner brings an opportunity, we can register it and they get additional discounts. Um, there's different ways you could do that. And there's a lot of policies. And so what I try to look for is I'll ask them, well, how did you guys do it at you know, F5? Or how did you do it at VMware? How did you do it at Dell? Take the best perspective, use my experience then to formulate the strategy based off of their experience, run it back by everybody again, and then we implement, right? And so that's what I mean when I talk about diversification is, is the different backgrounds within the industries and different companies. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. I want people that don't think like me because if everybody thinks like me, there's no problem to be solved. If I have four people that say, yes, 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 Mike, to everything, that's the worst thing I have, unless I'm right. Now, if I'm wrong and I've got four people on my team, I want four people to say, Mike, you're wrong. And I'm not embarrassed for them to tell me. And they're not afraid to tell me. You yeah. take people on my team and they're like, Mike, okay. we're not doing this. I know your attitude. I know you'd like to, but we don't have the resources. We can't do this. And you know what? I need that. So one of the things that I tell people is to be very cautious with social media. And the reason I say this is we all, come from different parts of the world and where we mm -hmm. come from, our life experiences shapes our thinking. Mm -hmm. And social media can enable people to talk to each other of all backgrounds <coughs> all over the world. But the second someone makes a post that says, I don't like people from this population, let's say political. I don't like green, 
the people of the Green Party. I like the people of the Red Party. I don't care. It's so irrelevant. But let's say you've got a Green Party and a Red Party. If the Green Party says, I don't like the Red Party people, two bad things happen. One, you've just lost 50% of the people because you said, I don't like Red Party people. And there's lots of Red Party people in this world. And two, you've signaled a hiring manager like me or potentially a hiring manager like Alvin. But you just said you can't work with people that are different than you. And our whole goal is to hire people from different backgrounds so we don't get all the same Cisco people saying, yes, Mike, this is exactly the way to do it. We yeah. want people that have a different background from different experiences so they could say the software expert knows this. The person from Oracle knows this. The person from Nimble Storage knows more about storage. The person from Dell EMC has got this. So I'm cautious and I tell my students to be very careful and scrub their social media of anything that does anything negative about anyone. Is that good advice in your experience being a leader for all these years? Absolutely, it is. And there's one thing that when you were talking about, Mike, is you said that you're not afraid of people talking back to you, your staff talking back to you and telling you you're wrong. And um, that's important, right? As a leader, I have a good idea of what I want to do, but I'm not always right. Um, and sometimes my staff will come to me and they'll tell me, they'll say, Alvin, we're we want to question you on this. And then I'll say, okay, tell me your logic. Um, and they walk through the logic and I think about it a second time. And then sometimes I'll say, yeah, you guys are right. I said, let's change it. My, my bad. Let's change it. Right. And do what you guys think. And so being a manager and being able to take a step back and, and admitting you're wrong sometimes too, is also super important. And you, you brought that up and that's a really good point as well. And as you, Chris just popped on, he's the Mr. Yes, man. I, when I hired Chris, I hired him for a reason. One, he was exceptionally smart. Two, is he had the perfect attitude. Three, is he do he works hard. But more importantly, he was not afraid to say no, Mike. And he was not afraid to say, Mike, I don't think it's a good idea. He's not afraid to me to say, Mike, you want to make 87 videos this week? Um, each video takes you at three hours of prep. So how do you where are you going to come up with the 300 hours? I need that from him because yeah. of otherwise, if he said, Mike, it's a great idea. I'd be in my house, I'd be on like the 50th video. I'd be like not sleeping for three days and we'd never even have that ability to get them edited. So yeah, so yeah, so, so wonderful. So so thank you for that. So I'd say, you know, let me ask you a couple more questions and let's have sure. some people ask you some questions because you bring so much value, you have sure. such experience and you know, I wanna make sure we, we we get to this, but you know, there also there were a couple of things that I wanted to get your perspective on. Yeah. So. You know, we both came from Cisco. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I loved about Cisco is it was very GE-like. You were going to be the first best or the second best in something, or we were getting out of it. Everything mm -hmm. was an ROI model. Everything was a blue shirt or a blue suit or a black suit with a light <laughs> blue shirt or a white shirt with a blue tie every single day. Black <laughs> shoes that were always polished. A black polished belt. Yeah. Everybody had an IBM think bag, except for me, who was carrying a Mac. And, you know, I remember I was actually at a meeting, and you know me, you remember my crazy workouts and things before I hurt my foot. And yeah. I remember I had a, I finally moved up into a serious leadership position, and somebody, my manager says to me something about my watch. And he's like, you think you could buy a good, a, a decent enough watch? We pay you enough. I'm like, what do you mean? This is a G-Shock watch. I time my 100-meter intervals in the pool. I've dropped it. I've hit it with kettlebells all day long, and it's still working. This is as good as it gets. Yeah, yeah. My manager just says, Mike, maybe something more appropriate of your role. So I learned that you had to wear a uniform. I think the uniforms are coming down a little bit over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for there was for a while, you know, there's that uniform that you had to wear, but... I would say, are you still wearing the uniform of the same suit? Or are you able to get a little more flexible these days? Yeah, no, it's changed quite a bit now, the industry, right? I mean, usually polos with, uh, you know, jeans or khakis are usually kind of the industry standard for the most part. Um, a lot of times I'll do uh, polos with, uh, or button up shirts, long sleeve with just slacks. Um, no more jackets are typically required, um, even at really, Every once in a while, though, for like if I have to do a meeting with like Deloitte or Accenture, some of the big guys, I will probably put a jacket on for some of those ones. But for the most part, uh, it's been, you know, kind of more relaxed for sure. And let me address this. Ariana, I'm so thankful you could join us. Ari, uh, Ariana, I think is Benin. He's either been Benin or Gabon in, uh, in Africa. So just the fact that you were able to join us, uh, you know, 
a, probably nine o'clock at night, maybe 10, based upon which of those countries you're in in Africa. Super grateful to have you here, Ariona. So, uh, so, so yeah, so let's take some questions from the audience. Oh, Gabon, I knew, you were, I knew you were near Nigeria. I thought it was Gabon or Benin. I just wasn't sure which one. It's always great having you here, Ariana. You add so much. Chris, if you want to bring up one of the questions from the audience for a few minutes. If not, I can keep talking to my good friend, Alvin. Nick, you talked about technique to put words together and not just throw jargons. Could you please share that? Um, so, Nick, are you looking for an example of that? And, of course, there's a 60-second delay. So I'll give an example, Alvin, and maybe you can give an example. An example like might be, we're going to migrate you to the cloud for the following reasons. You're currently in your data center, and you've mentioned to us that your servers are, are constantly full, that no matter how fast you add servers, you can't keep up with the growth and development. So what we can do is we can take you to the cloud. The cloud is really nothing more than a hosted network in a data center, just like you have now, but we get some special advantages. With the cloud, we have the ability to scale up computing resources on demand. So if your server CPU, say, is above 75% or whatever threshold we can, we can add additional servers. So the benefit for you to the cloud is you can do exactly everything you're doing now. We don't even have to change anything. We can just take your current infrastructure and move it there. But the cloud will give you the agility to scale up as needed. So if you've got a Christmas sale, we've got extra servers. If you get new customers, we've got extra servers. So really, it's about making the technology work for you to help you grow without things. Now, maybe, Alvin, you could do something in the data center to give an example. Yeah, so like, I mean, I think when they're talking about, like, you don't want to just throw, like when you're meeting with customers, you don't want to throw out like a whole bunch of technical jargon to like, you know, like a, like a CTO or somebody like that, that's more on the business process side. Um, so you got to relate your conversations to the actual, well, know your audience, number one, of who you're presenting to. And when you're talking, like, for example, one of the biggest issues we have, like with a lot of stores like Walmart and Kroger and Safeway is loss prevention, right? People are constantly shoplifting. And so the conversation that we typically would have around data center is, hey, now with artificial intelligence, there's technologies that you could leverage to help prevent that and save you close to a billion dollars of revenue um a billion dollars of lost revenue um over the course of the next few years and the way we do that is we have a product called dgx that we put in the data center that allows us to connect to edge devices on the edge device there would be cameras that locate facial recognition and then we have software that runs on the dgx that detects any um behavior that's malicious uh we work with isv software vendors like a malong or ever seen and we couple the solution together and that's kind of how we would um, talk about like loss prevention so i never go into the specifics of oh yeah we're going to run like mpls and do all the this we just really got the high level uh, is typically what we do and that way they don't get lost in all the technical jargon um but also, also again it, it depends on your audience right if you're talking to the person who's implementing this solution the it manager then you may need to go into those technical specifications that's exactly the point so Alvin was being CXO relevant. Right now, that's what an executive officer cares about. How do I grow my business? How do I increase my customer intimacy? How do I increase my sales? How do I reduce expenses? That's what they care about. Nope, he didn't talk about CUDA cores. He could, but he didn't talk about CUDA cores, and he didn't talk about any machine learning libraries. He could. Alvin can get as deep as you ever needed him to, but you know, at the executive level, he's doing architecture work. Yeah. And, you know, that's where these architecture roles get kind of confusing. There are these solution architect roles, which I consider to be junior architect roles, where they're pretty technically focused. And then there's these cloud architect roles and enterprise architect roles. And when you're getting these cloud architect jobs and these enterprise architect jobs, you really got to convince the customer, just the same way Alvin did, how you're going to save the money. How are you going to increase their uptime? How are you going to increase the performance? How do you increase customer intimacy? How do you create new services that generate revenue? It's not about reading S3, EC2, and Macy, WAF, and Shield. It's not about that. It's about what problem are you solving? What modulars are you using? And I encourage all people not even to think in terms of the service of a vendor. Okay, so look at it this way. What am I trying to achieve? I need, to I need storage. Okay, what are the performance requirements of the storage? What do I need in terms of IOPS? What do I need in terms of throughput? Given that, what's the best interface? Is it fiber channel? Is it 10 gig E? Is it 100 gig E? Do I need block storage or object storage? Is it data that I write once and read many? 
or is it data that changes all the time? These are the architectural things they are going into. It's not how to configure it. It's not how to code. Architects don't code. Architects don't configure. Architects design, but you got to convince the customer they need that design. And you can't do the design unless you understand the underlying technologies. Yeah, correct. And you have to be able to go deep in those conversations. Like, for example, when you're talking about cloud, one of the things that um, customers always like to wonder about is security. How secure is the cloud? Um, and then the second thing is if you're uh, multi-homing on a, on a single system, how's my data protected from the other person if I don't have a dedicated server to me, right? And so these yeah. are, as a SA, you have to be able to speak to that technically of like, hey, how does a solution work? How security work in a solution? Um, as well as being able to have the CXO type of relevant conversations yeah. as well. That's the key. It's, you know, with the technical people, having the technical conversation, with the executives, having executive conversation but focus more on the communication as opposed to the doing. The engineers are doing the doing. The architect is doing the designing and the presenting. So as an architect, you're gonna speak with a whole lot of engineers along the way to help make sure it's the best. As an executive, you're gonna speak with your technical team to get it done. <clears throat> Any of these hybrid roles like an architect where they're at least as much business as they are technical, business skills, communication skills, presentation skills, in my experience matter at least as much. From a leadership perspective, Alvin, how much of the soft skills, emotional intelligence presence? Oh, quite a bit. You have to understand. I mean, p customers want to buy from people that they could trust, that they feel that are honest, integrity, good moral values, ethics are all super critical in being able to close deals. Um, uh, but the biggest one is they have to be able to trust you. Like there were some times where we knew as sales reps that a product was not stable and it's better to be honest as opposed to getting your 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 deal closed to be honest and say, hey, I would wait a couple of releases. There's a few bugs we're working through, as opposed to selling that customer a bad a bad product. And then next you know, when you try to sell him things further on, he's gonna have second questions, he's gonna be doubting you, second thoughts. Um, so it's always good to have integrity and make sure you're honest with them as well. I I, I you know, I, I I love having you here because it's you know, we came up from the same place. I remember two separate occasions in my career. The first one, I was in Dubai. I was doing the first voice, data, and fiber to the home back when I was at Riverstone Networks. The customer was unbelievable. They had bought a lot of stuff. It didn't work. I went there, and I just got lucky and fixed it. Now, I'd like to say I was a great multicast engineer, but I think luck had at least as much to do with it as anything. After I fixed it, the customer trusted me. And, yeah. you know, I remember closing the deal. I was there. They're like, well, you're here. We're going to buy more. I'm like, okay. They're like, dude, what do we need to do? I'm like, I don't know. Um, tell me what you want. I'll call the sales rep and I'll make sure they process the order for you and they can figure it out. Because I was a systems engineer at the time. And I remember on my last trip there, or two, the trip prior to my last trip, they're like, Mike, you know, Cisco's got this new router switch that's supposed to do multicast forwarding better than ours. Is it better? I remember taking a deep breath because whenever I get one of these situations, I always like to take a slow, deep breath. And I remember saying to my friend, the customer, Rizwan, I said, Rizwan, here's the thing. The Cisco product's better than ours right now. I said, you'd be wrong for me to say our box is as good as theirs. Theirs is about 10% better. You've come to me before. You've asked me lots of questions. I've given you honest answers. I'm giving you an honest answer. No. What I did not expect was that was Rizwan to take three seconds and say, Mike, that's why the order's yours. I said, what? He said, we know Cisco's is better than yours, but they don't have you. And they don't have anybody that's going to tell me no. Or at least we don't know anybody that's going to tell me no, it's not the right product. So we want it anyway. Fast yeah. forward a couple of years. I was in the healthcare vertical. I was a strategy consulting working for Cisco. And somebody came up with this great idea. They were going to put nurse call on a portable phone so that the nurses could be disturbed every three seconds that a patient wants orange juice. <laughs> and they're like, Mike, isn't this the best idea ever? And I said, well... Here's the way I see this. The nurse is concerned with making sure the patient survives the hospital stay. The nurse knows the patients would like their pillows fluffed. The nurse knows the patients are lonely and the nurse knows the patients would like their orange juice. But what the nurse needs to do is make sure the patients live, get better and get out of the hospital. I said, the nurse already knows the patients want them. They're already feeling guilty. They don't have enough time. So if you deploy this solution, I think it's gonna drive the nurses nuts, make their lives even miserable. They're gonna be so cranky and frustrated, they're gonna treat the patients poorly, and I think it's gonna decrease customer service. What I didn't expect was as follows. 
The chief nursing officer starts laughing and says, isn't that what I told you? The chief medical informatics officer said, yeah, we were thinking the same thing. The CEO said, I keep hearing this from everybody except the sales reps. I want this, Mike, but I know it's not right. Thank you. And then I said, but well, you know what could help? If we could take the patient's EKGs and send that to the phone so you know if it's an emergency or not an emergency. I said, you know what? It would also be cool if we could use RFID tagging and on this IP phone to see where the IV pumps and the wheelchairs would be. That would be useful to you. But this nurse call thing, horrible idea. I wish we didn't invent it, and I don't want to sell it to you. CEO said something I never heard before. He said, just design what you want, and we'll buy it. He said, that's it. I went like, but he's like, just tell me what I need and I don't care. That was the basis of my healthcare technology architecture career. The first call I went on, I said, no, this is not right. The customer liked it so much. They said, design it yourself. That year I traveled over 300,000 miles a year consulting to the largest global healthcare technologies in the world. The country of Scotland, the province of Victoria, Austria, all over um, um, Brisbane, which was felt like Palm Beach, Florida when I was in Palm Beach, Brisbane all over the US, the Middle East, South America, all because I told one customer, don't buy this because it's not right for you. So it's all about integrity. Yeah. All about yeah. integrity. Chris has sent me a message that we have 11 questions. So Chris, bring up one of the questions. From Jesse Murgog. Alvin, favorite time to tune in. Uh, this is all you, Alvin. <laughs> so usually it depends, right? Sometimes I try to get in early in the morning because that's when all the the you, you got to get a read on the market, what's going to happen for the day. Uh, so I try to get in early, like around six six thirty in the morning, if I can. But if not, um, usually the evenings to catch the recap of what happened. They usually do a nice summary at the end of what's uh, why the markets were down or why they were up. Um, so those are typically what I try to do uh, for the most part. <laughs> Good question, Jesse. Great and great answer, Alvin. That's also when I typically look at things first thing in the morning to see what's going on for the day. In the end, what happened? I don't watch a lot of news because I like to keep my mind clear and I don't like and I and I I don't have a lot of time, but I do focus on the financial news every day for industry trends. Yeah. Harshall, how to deal with imposter syndrome, watching with individuals around you with 20 search taking better physicians talking cloud jargon. Marshall, I'll answer it, and then I want Alvin to answer it as well. I believe that imposter syndrome can be one of two things. One is you know you don't know enough, and you need to learn. For example, when I first learned to practice medicine, I was out school, I was done school, and it was like I knew exactly what to do if someone was a massive car incident, had a massive heart attack, but now all of a sudden somebody had a headache. And you know, coming from an emergency medicine background to family medicine, I didn't know. So I went home and literally read a thousand pages per year. But here's what I will tell you this. Marshall, when I see someone with 20 certifications and talking jargon, I know they don't know anything because I know you can't be a podiatrist, a neurosurgeon, an airplane pilot, a construction worker, a cloud architect, a security architect, a Wall Street executive all at the same time. And when I see 20 certs, I know someone that went to a good exam dump place, memorized questions and answers and knows nothing. So when I see that, I feel very confident because i because I look at it this way, from the art of war, know yourself, know your enemy, and you'll always be victorious. I know that an enemy that's certified in everything effectively knows nothing about nothing. So I feel extra good. I know I can win that competition. And when people speak jargon, 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 I also know they don't understand anything harsh. If you really understand it, you take an expert like Alvin, he can explain anything very technically. There's a book called Why Business People Speak Like Idiots, which one of my executive coaches sent to me. And you know what was really great about this? There's something called abusification. If Alvin was going to interview me on networking, and Alvin can do it and has done it in the past, if I were to say interior gateway protocols like OSPF work in the following manner, they send a bunch of LSAs to each other. And there's these type 1 LSAs that are router SSAs and type 2 that are by the designated router, type 3, which are intra-area type 4 or how to reach the external routes. It's an ASBR summary route. Type five is a summary external route. But of course, if you've got a not so stubby area, it's going to be a type seven, which is really a type five. Now, while that's actually there, what did Alvin hear from me? The manager, are you interested in hiring me for anything or do I just sound like a jargon stringer together? Yeah, bunch of jargon for sure. Now, Harshal, if I said to Alvin, I'm going to do this, Alvin, what you need in your organization is a high performance routing protocol something that can take your network and self-heal, something that if there's a cable cut within five seconds can reroute around it so your services and applications are always there, something to improve your user's experience, 
Now, Alvin, would you be interested in that? Yep. Okay, so don't string the heart. When you hear someone stringing buzzwords together, Harshal, you know they're not your competition. Unless your goal is to be the engineer that configures things all day and not an architect, and I know your goal is to be a, an architect, Harshal, when they talk about that, realize you win. You just beat your competition because they're communicating in a manner that's not going to represent them well. 20 certs means they know a little bit about cooking. They know a little bit about software. They know a little bit about databases. I don't want that. I want someone that spent the last two years learning data science. I want someone that spent the last eight months learning nothing other than security. I want someone that's an expert that's so good. But that's my perspective. Now, Alvin, I was a different perspective. He hires constantly. Um, what would What do you look for? Yeah, I think it's, it's very similar to what you're saying, Mike, a lot of the, the concepts. Um, but usually when somebody's doing that many different types of certifications or backgrounds, they're not really specialized in one area, right? And now with these new technologies that have come out, like cloud adoption and data science and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we tend to look for, because those topics are big topics in itself. So you tend to want to have specialized people. Um, and so... I look at, like when I look at resumes and certifications on the technical side, I look to see the relevant machine learning classes, data science classes they've taken, or if I'm doing something in the cloud, what are the relevant cloud certifications they've taken? Less of the like CCNAs, NPs, security stuff. Um, Mike's exactly right. Typically those guys uh, have so much, you can only hold so much in your head. And so I think specialized is the way I would typically look at the people. And Harshal, I know you. I knew your capabilities. You're strong. You like security, Harshal? Focus on that cloud security piece. Be the best in it. When everybody else is learning cooking and cleaning and dog walking and photography and videography, which is the equivalent, you'll be the best at what you do. Then Juma, thanks, Mike and Alvin. This session is rich and one of the best you've attended so far. I'm so thankful. Watching yeah. from Nigeria, Dan Juma. That's wow, cool. that's so really wonderful. That's I awesome. don't know what's going on in Nigeria with regards to technical development, but there is some of the most technical development I've ever seen. Absolutely, I'm really privileged. I have over 80 Nigerian students working with me and thousands and thousands of wonderful people from all over Africa that are watching our materials, getting certified, doing whatever they need to do in their careers. So welcome from Nigeria. We're super thrilled to have you from Nigeria. And uh, super happy. We also have a tremendous number of students from the Cameroon, neighboring Gabon and Benin, lots from South Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, Tanzania, Somalia. So lots of big tech investment there. Thrilled you're joining us from Africa. Awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> We're all over <laughs> India, Pakistan, Australia, China right now on this call. And, you know, single player, I'm just looking at the name South America. It's just awesome. So, Rand, this question is for you. I'm sorry, Alvin, this question is for you. This is from Rand Tal. Rand Tal is a great cloud architect. I know him personally. Mm -hmm. He's fantastic. Yeah, so I definitely would do a startup, right? I mean, so the so what's interesting is the way I got to NVIDIA was not because of my Cisco experience. It was because of my startup experience. Startups, you can't underestimate them. Some are successful and some won't be but the experience you gain in a startup is invaluable because what happens is you're, you're doing everything end to end. When I got signed up at the startup, I was doing channel marketing. I was doing channel programs. I was doing channel sales. There was just a lot of different things that I was doing. And so that's going to be essential and skill sets that you'll, you'll, you won't gain at a big company at big companies. Typically they're silo jobs. Like you're in charge of programs, you're in charge of promotions, you're in charge of engineering at a startup. You have the opportunity to do everything. Uh, and that's pretty phenomenal experience. And I think that's what ultimately led to my career growth was working that startup. So I would definitely do it again. So and I'm going to take that on as well. You know, it's interesting because I worked at Riverstone Networks prior to actually joining Cisco. Riverstone Networks was a spinoff of the old Cabletron. The old Cabletron was a big established company, which Cisco kind of crushed. And they basically had one really cool box. And they basically split off to Antaresis, which became enterprise feature functionality. And all the big, heavy routing gurus, they became uh, Riverstone. And Riverstone was this great technical company. Now, here's what I can tell you. I was in my early 20s when I was at Riverstone, mid-20s. I don't know, sometime after I left healthcare. Here's what I did. I'd write the product requirements definitions for the products that were there. Then I would go sell things. Then I was a support system to the engineer. 
Then I was a consulting systems architect. Then I was a team lead. Then I was managing a group of people. When I wasn't doing that, I was an escalation point for the TAC. I was like tier five support, you know, to go to the tier three support. Then I would go to some engineers and then it would go to me. I did everything. I worked 20 hours a day. But you know what? Those startups, you don't have the support. You are the everything. And in the process of being the everything, get your hands dirty on a lot of things. So when I train people, I train them for focus because I have no choice because I've got a short amount of time to train people to be great at something. But what I will tell you is this, those three or four years that I spent in that small company where I did marketing, I did sales, I did engineering, I did architecture, I did tech support, customer service. I learned so much. Yeah. And then uh, it's funny. I, I guess it was about a year ago before I started this or right around the same time I had interviewed with a very good tech company. They were going to give me a distinguished architect position. And when they were doing it, they're like, have you done this before? I'm like, yep, I did that back in 2001 at Riverstone. Have you done this before? Yes, I've done that in 2001 at Riverstone. Have you done this before? Yes, I did that at Cisco. But the funny thing was I did more of those at that startup than mm -hmm. I did in a decade at Cisco. Yes. Completely agree with Alban startups are a great chance to get experience. Now, here's the thing with startup. They're not well funded. Most fail. So you can go. They can give you a lot of stock. You could be instantly rich. You can go and they can fail. But you will be working hard at a startup. But you will also. Without a doubt. Yeah. Jawad, Alvin, what is the best thing you have learned in your journey from where you began to where you are now? What helped, what helped you do well as you took on bigger roles? So I think for this one, um, the best thing that I've learned was one is networking with people, learning from people, um, doing the required uh, like certs that I needed to do to help me get to the next level and understand the technology. Um, and then as I took on bigger roles, what helped me was um, making sure I researched the market that I was in. So like I work in artificial intelligence, so I have to understand what the industry trends are. Um, I think the second thing is, is having the experience, right? Because I worked all those small roles uh, and worked my way up the organic way, I was exposed to a lot of different things and the startup experience helped me quite a bit. And so that ultimately what helped me take on the bigger roles is just the knowledge and depth um that i had uh, from from the experience and um now for me to paint vision and strategy it's pretty straightforward for me because i understand like processes and operations and funding and how all this stuff works now um so as you guys go through your journey it's important that you have mentors you learn from a, one another talk to your coworkers, talk to your peers people like Mike that are helping you through instruction um, and then make sure you're absorbing that experience. Cause as you move up the rank, your that experience is going to pay dividends in the future. Great answer, Alvin. Chris, you want to bring up the next one? Afri P question. How much does the company care about its valuation in an overpriced market? And how does the quality of a higher impact the real value of the company to generate profit? That's kind of a tough one, right? Um, I think our company ultimately does uh, care about valuation, but what's more important for us is we care about our strategy, right? And so at the end of the day, you know, our CEO tells us like, hey, the stock's going to do what it's going to do, right? It's going to go up. It's going to come down. Yeah, there's a lot of valuation. You know, you know, a lot of stocks are trading at PE ratios in the 50s, 100s, et cetera. And there's a, they're very overvaluated. Um, but at the end of the day, what really matters is, is for us is if our strategy is correct and what are we doing within the various segments of our business. Um, so our CEO doesn't really look at the quarter earnings. He basically says, hey, as long as our strategy is correct, in the long run, we're going to be OK. Um, the quality of the hire it really depends, right? Because when you're looking at um, smaller companies, like a startup where you may have 100 people to 300 people, the quality mm -hmm. of the hire matters, especially on the role they're in. If they're running the channel segment or they're running segment sales and their CRO or something, then yeah, the quality quality will, different, will definitely matter. If you're looking at hiring within a 15,000 
a people organization and you're just hiring um, one of the essays to cover 10 accounts of your 500 accounts, it may not matter as much. So it really depends, right, on, you know, the opportunity, the size of the company, um, which position you're hiring for. So there's a lot of different factors in there. It's really, that's a great way to answer, Alvin. Love the answer. What I'll say in experiences, it is startup. You got to be really good. <laughs> like, that's not the place to go if you're new and inexperienced as a rule, unless you get lucky, because you're going to be wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. So it, it's almost good to start one job that's easy. Uh, and then, you know, not easy, but where you're in a support system. So like for when I joined Cisco, for example, my first manager, I was there for about two weeks. And I said, what am I supposed to do other than just learn stuff? And he says, I have no expectations, Mike, for you for six months. He said, here's what I want you to do. Here's a company credit card. Go take people to lunch and go meet people. You're going to need those networks later. I said, how much can I do this? My manager says, unlimited. I said, he said, seriously, what your job is right now is to go meet as many people and go develop the best relationship you can and learn our product, learn our first service offering, learn how to navigate this giant company so you can get things done. He said, it's not like where you come from. He said, I came from the old cable tron. He said, you just call the CEO on the phone every five minutes that you need something done. You call the SVP and you get it done. There's 300 people there, 500 people there. He said, there's 80,000 people here. He says, the best thing that I can teach you to do is to figure out who to call and make sure you have the relationships to be able to get the job done. And that's realistically what I did. So realistically speaking, um, that's what I did. So Afri P, um, I think Alvin and I answered your question. Chris, if you want to bring up the next one. Jesse Murdoch. Alvin, if you could sum up your workspace culture and how that would and how that would look, what's it like to work with you for your company? Yeah, so we have a really good work culture at our company. Um, it started with innovation at the engineering level, and it's really about fostering teamwork. Um, we're for the amount of revenue we generate, we're a pretty small company overall. Um, we're about roughly fifteen thousand employees now. Uh, when I started, we're about five thousand employees, um, so we've hired quite a bit. Um, the culture is what I like about it is there's no titles here. Um, I work with uh, a person that's, I have a manager and this person reports to the manager and I work directly with her. She's fresh out of college. Um, she's only been out of college for maybe three years, but she helps me with all my reporting. Uh, and there's just no, she calls me directly. I call her directly. There's, it's, there's no titles here. It's a very flat organization. Um, at the end of the day, the mission is the boss right? And our mission is to sell and democratize uh, artificial intelligence. And so um, what the culture is, is basically everybody helps one another. Uh, you try to do the best you can to, to accomplish the mission. And that's ultimately what makes a good culture. Um, as a manager, every manager is responsible for culture on their team, right? And one of the things I try to do culturally is give my team the flexibility to, you know, to work from home. I, I do two events a year. I do an annual picnic uh, in the summer and I do a Christmas party um, that I host at my house and I invite everybody over along with their families and I try to get to know people and just talk about other things outside of work. Um, and that's super important when you're building rapport with your team because now you're, you're not only a manager, but you're their friend. Um, and the nice thing is I've been fortunate enough to hire intelligent people where they don't cross the line right? They still respect me as a friend. I mean, they like me as a friend, but they respect me as a manager. And so culture is really driven on multiple levels within the organization, within the team. And then our company specifically does a lot of different things um, for like, like I'm Indian. And so there's Diwali celebrations that they do. When that comes around, they have uh, the Hispanic Heritage Month. They have, um, you know, the Black Network, uh, NVIDIA Network, BNN. So there's like a lot of different things to di for diversity within our organization. And so it's really a great company to work for. And I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. That's kind of nice celebrating people from who they are. Yeah. You know, I love that. Part of being in a, so international is it was Guruji Day. And, you know, people started sending me messages. And then they call, I re people reached out to me to Teacher's Day and other holidays. It's super important. We're all from different parts of the world. This is technology. There are 7 billion people out there. 
And we need the best and the brightest out of those 7 billion to do what we need to do. The mission is there. You heard it very clearly. How do we make AI do more, get it in the hands of people to change our lives? That's a mission. Note, again, we didn't mention GPU in there. That's the mission. The GPU is one of the tools, one of the vehicles to help NVIDIA do that. It's yeah. a tool. Tech is a tool. The reason NVIDIA is so successful is they have leaders like Alvin. They've got a leader that sees the technology problem and is hyper-focused on making the best tech to solve that problem. And, and you know, one of the things that Alvin just talked about, which is why NVIDIA is so successful, it's flat. So Alvin gets to hear from the person that just got out of college. So he's got a large number of people that work for him. But it's not like the, the worst organizations are this. You've got a manager, a senior manager, a senior, senior manager, a director, a senior, senior director, a VP, a senior VP, an EVP, an executive, executive VP. Here's what happens. Everybody's busy telling the leadership everything's great. By the time it gets to the leadership, they don't even know the business anymore. So right, right now, Alvin hiring best and brightest in a flat organization, he knows. There's not a day where Alvin doesn't have his ear to the ground. He's in the trenches. So... He's equally at home with the CEO and he's equally at home with the people that just got out of college. That's the critical thing. I think Alvin, what you said there was one of the most important leadership things. They can get to you. They're not afraid to be honest with you and you hear it. Yeah. Uh, also, some people have criticized me over the years, um, one or two. They're like, you can't be friends with your employees. And I'm saying, are you crazy? I have to work with these people every single day of the week. It's going to yeah. be a whole lot better if we're friends. If yeah. I can call someone and say, help me with this, and they like me, they're going to do it. Jesse, that nice young man, is, is my newest hire um, in the next couple of weeks. I, I think he's an awesome guy, and I like that. And I know that he's going to tell me, Mike, like he did today, I had to run one of my calls. And on the call, I said, Jesse, you got to stop me at 2.30. And every five minutes, he reminded me, 2.30, we've got to stop. He wasn't afraid to do that. That's the quality of the team matters 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 so right excellent uh chris if you want to bring up the next question yun mag prasad at times while working with clients have you had to do something which is not related the work we're expected to do how did you ask for a transition so are you talking about so this question is kind of interesting because it could be talking about like entertaining right like you know, it's not related to work, but I had to take a customer out to dinner or to take them to a ball game or something to that effect. Um, when you're in sales, that happens quite a bit. Um, there's dinners you have to go to, um, ball games you get invited to. And um, one of the main reasons why you do that is because you have to um, build rapport with your customer. To Mike's point, you want to be you want to ultimately have that them treat as friends, like look at you as a friend, right? When you're trying to sell an opportunity, so you become trustworthy. Uh, with them. And so I find this very common. If you're thinking, if that's what I, how I read the question, that's kind of how I, I look at it. I don't know, Mike, if you have a different perspective. You know, it's, it's interesting because I read Umang's questions and I have two sides of that. One is I was going to say, your job may be an architect, but you may be spending six figures of company money for entertaining clients. I know I did every year because if you don't have the relationship with the client, you can't do that. Now, there's the other side of this. Like, how, for example, I worked with a big bank and I was Mr. Voice. At least that was a, my, the job I was supposed to be. Now, while I'd be there, Mr. Voice, somebody would say, hey, we got some kind of thing going on with the switch. Um, oh. Could you help us out? And, you know, here's the thing. I worked for Cisco. I could call TAC and I could escalate it. So I'd sure help them out. I was there. Was it what I was doing? No, but it didn't matter. If I get to a customer site and they ask for help, if it's not my job, I'm probably still going to do it. Now, I'm going to let the customer know that we're doing it as a favor for them so that we can uh, let them know not to expect this from us. Also, if you read any of the work by Rabo Caldini on persuasion and exercising influence, you know, once you do something for someone else, typically speaking, via the principle of reciprocity, they're likely to do something for you. So I don't really have a definition as to what is the job um, for anything. You know, my students are only supposed to ask questions on the Monday and Friday calls or via Slack, but you know what? If somebody can't figure out how to get to the call and they want to send me a text message, I can't say no. I want to like, come to the call, come to the call. Here's the link. I want you here. I want you to learn. So, you and Mag, I think there's a job that we're supposed to do. And I think there's probably whatever it takes to be successful is probably what I recommend, or at least that's what I've done. Yeah. They're not always the same thing. Yeah. As long as it's in the customer's best interest, though.
Mrs. Laman Jama, what a cool name. Um, with your experience as a cloud architect, is it easier to pitch customers as an income agency generating cloud execution or an expense? Uh, Mrs. Laman, I think it's neither. Um, I think it's really about what can you do for the customer? How can you transform that customer's business? Look, going from the data center to the cloud could be five times the cost, even though it's supposed to be cheaper. Being yeah. in the cloud could be three times cheaper. It's really based upon the use case. So I deal with customers. I ask what are the customer's business challenges? What does the customer want to achieve? Are they trying to increase sales? Are they trying to increase customer intimacy? Are they trying to increase brand awareness? What do they want to do? And then as a cloud architect, I think about all the technology available and not just that. As single cloud vendors, I think about all the technology. Is it a communication platform? Is it AI? Is it, is it uh, network gear? Is it security gear? I don't know what it is. And then I look at it and then I basically use run a business analysis. Similar customers that adopted similar technology in similar situation obtained a 30% increase in sales, a 20% uh, OPEX, CAPEX reduction. So, but I don't know what it is. So I've got to evaluate the business. So I would say it's easiest to solve the customer's problem. If the customer is trying to save money, then go save them money. If the customer is trying to increase sales, then increase sales, and that's your solution. Every customer is going to have a different solution. That's why to be an architect, business acumen is required, emotional intelligence is required, leadership is required, sales skills are required, and the ability to ask question after question after question after question after question. After question. How many questions do you need to to to, or what do, would your team need to ask to really be able to solve someone's problem, Alvin? Is it, say, do you want AI or is it a much deeper discussion than that? Yeah, definitely deeper discussions, right? It's what quite a big Yeah. So, hope we answered your question there, Mrs. Laman Jamin. Cool Barrett name, by the way. That is a cool name. <laughs> Kamivi, I've been watching you for a couple of days and you're really impressed with your background. Thank you so much. For someone without IT, how to embrace this new journey and be ready in 16 weeks? Alvin, I'm going to ask that because he's asking about my program. What he's asking about is our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. So I have a 16-week program that's designed to take people and turn them into cloud architects. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what I like to say. For someone that's got any technology background, I can typically do it in about 16 weeks mm -hmm. and about 250 to 500 hours worth of training. Okay. It's totally focused training all on one thing, the business acumen, the architecture, we pretty much removed everything other than exactly what's necessary to do the job. Now, if somebody's never been in tech before, I take them into the same program, but instead of keeping in them for four months, I keep them there for six months to eight months. I don't charge extra, they just attend more classes. And more classes, they learn more. Now, in this time, in this longer process, the student gets 500, 700, 800 hours of experience. So it gives the student with no background the chance to really become great. To me, the key is taking one of these jobs is as follows, being great at it, communicating well, having the right attitude, energy, enthusiasm, and presence. See, when it's your first job, and where Alvin started with Help Desk, my first job was senior network engineer at one of the world's largest ISPs. Both are great places to start. I started someplace different. It doesn't really matter. I convinced the hiring manager that my experience practicing medicine was nearly the same as it would be as a network architect. You know what? It was. What did I do practicing medicine? I asked the client some questions. I did an examination of their system. I made a diagnosis and wrote them a prescription. What do I do as a network architect or a cloud architect? I meet with the client. I ask them some questions. I evaluate their systems. I make a hypothesis and I write a prescription. I write a, I write a prescription called that architecture. It's the same <laughs> job. So what I would say when you're new, if 50% of the, what goes into being an interview is what you sound like, your attitude, energy, enthusiasm, presence, and 50% is your technical competency, I can't get you, nor could anybody ever get you to 50 out of 50 on technical competency in 16 weeks but I can get you to 35 out of 40 and ask Alvin how many 35 or 40 out of 50s he's interviewed in the last 20 years. Yeah, lots. Not many. Oh, the 35 to 50, yeah. 35, out of 50, 35 or 40 out of 50, how many uh, How many people in the technical competency and people do you know that can be 40 out of 50? Oh, not very many, it's, it's hard, right? And then what I try and do is yeah. I try and get you to a 50 out of 50 on the soft skills, energy, and yeah. enthusiasm. So now when you average it out, 
you get an 85 to 90 out of 100. How many 85 to 90s have you had on the, have you had interviewed and how fast did you hire them? Yeah, those ones are good, right? Because now you're balancing more of the soft skills and everything. And that's important, Mike, that you mentioned that, right? Because I think uh, this is the first step is getting your 16 week training. But at the end of the day, um, you also have to have the soft skills and a lot of the other skills, interviewing skills to, to make sure you get that first job. And, and also the first job member is always going to be a stepping stone for your next job. Right. Yes. So like you're not going to land like many people think, oh, OK, I'm going to graduate or I take this class. I'm going to go work for Amazon or Microsoft Azure. That's probably not going to happen. Right. You're probably going to start off with some startup or some smaller company, get get your experience and then move on and progress your career accordingly. And so that's really important to understand as well as is, is, is making sure you get into a, a company to back up your experience with or to get experience based off of your knowledge that you've gained. And it may not actually be one of the cloud providers. I mean, the cloud providers offer a lot. Mm -hmm. Amazon actually hires people with no experience. And I've gotten some students there. But, you know, really? Every global retailer needs cloud architects. Every internet service provider has cloud architects because they also have clouds. Every big four consulting firm like Deloitte hires cloud architects. IBM has an incredible number of cloud architects. Red Hat is another of them. Palo Alto has a tremendous number, but so does every company. Look at every major Fortune 500 company. What are they doing? They have big networks, big data centers, and a cloud. What's going on? They're barely using the cloud to offload. They're using them for disaster recovery. And they're migrating there. Wait, big data. All this data coming in from everywhere. What are we going to do with this live clickstream data? Hey, wait, all these years of data that we've aggregated. Wait, that screams machine learning, artificial intelligence all over it. So right now, we've been, been in the fundamentals. We've been giving the network to have the performance that you can have your computers anywhere. We can be yeah. now we've got these GPUs that can do data science. And I think, you know, five, 10 years from now, I mean, I'm looking at this Quadro A5000 card I have, and it's just unbelievable. I had a Quadro 4000 card five years ago, and it was unbelievable then. But that Quadro yeah. 4000 and this Quadro A5000, they're not even in the same universe. Yeah. I could run a blockchain facility on these cards. Yeah. If <laughs> I really wanted to. Yeah, that's right. That's and they're right. not going to overheat. They're, they're really amazing. So just yeah. watch how that's progressed. I got a yeah. bunch of those cards because somewhere along the line, we're going to be doing some fancy data science around here. Yeah. And you know, Mike, another point you mentioned, aside from like the um, Palo Alto networks of the world and IBMs, don't forget that Amazon and GCP and Azure have partners that resell their services, yep. right? So there's like a WWT, like a Trace3, all these type of resellers of AWS that are also hiring all these cloud architects because they want to resell their services. So another way you can look at it is when you go to the AWS websites and you look up their partners, there's a lot of partners out there that will be offering jobs. Exactly. And I remember I, I spent a very short period of time over at Dimension Data, a million and one years ago, now they're NTT Data. South African company that was mm -hmm. big, one of the biggest Cisco Gold partners in the world. Those are the companies that really pay. Yeah. Because they're the people that basically have you do a little of this, a little of that. They're integrating things. They're basically making money by reselling other people's products. So there's they're not even buying anything, or they're just buying it and reselling it. So fast turnover, fast revenue collection, and yeah, lots of great jobs. So those MSPs or managed service providers, like he's talking about cloud providers, big enterprises. I think if you just think of the cloud providers, you're only dealing with like 3% of the cloud architect positions that are out there. Maybe the other 97% are from these other great companies. So don't limit yourself to them. Yeah, agreed. Chin Lim, besides presentation skills, what can we do to influence or persuade the C-level? I've got answers here, um, but I'll let Alvin go and then I'll be the second person. I think the thing is with um, your presentation, one, one of the things that you have to do with C-levels is you have to have, um, first of all, good executive presence. You have to be prepared, um, you know, when you, not only from a presentation perspective, but in case they ask you anything else, you always want to show up with, um, you know, your team uh, because the, the C-levels have very limited time. So you want to make sure you have your network architect there, your sales account manager there, et cetera. Um, also, I think, um, this is where the soft skills come in, right? You really have to, with C-levels, build the reputation and rapport with them. Uh, make sure you take, you know, like spend time to like get to know them either like at a dinner or at a ball game or something. Um, those are super important as well. 
Um, and sea levels typically at that level, they're going to be really about the financials, right? And you don't always have to have the best price to win opportunities. There's times where, you know, Mike can attest to this. We've won plenty of opportunities, but we didn't have the best price. A lot of it could be how much they like you. If you, if they feel you're, you know, you're like a committed person, you're honest, you're trustworthy. Um, it could be just, just a lot of factors in the brand name. There's a lot of factors that go into persuading a sea level. Yeah. And I'm going to echo what Alvin said, because I completely agree with all of it, because it comes down to finances and because it comes down to how do you influence the business business and it is what opportunities you can do to change the business. This is where that business acumen really comes in. This is where the knowledge of a CXO who's concerned about the organizational strategy, increasing revenue, et cetera, comes in. This is where when you know the CFO is the financial gatekeeper of the money, and they're looking for more ROI modeling and much more financial metrics, you got to change it. Now, when you're dealing with the chief technology officer, you might be dealing with an innovator that's looking to use the tech to change the business. So this person, you might be, look at those cool tech things and look what this technology can do. So you're going to have to modify that based upon the audience. So that's why CXO relevancy is there. Now, when I moved into executive strategy roles and leadership roles in Cisco, I think I took 15, 10 or 15 CXO relevancy classes because they would just send us for class and class and class. What does the CEO care about it? They wanted us to present. Then they had us change with different executive personality types, functional personality types, intuitive personality types like me versus uh, analytical. So you got to be able to communicate to the people, visual, auditory, kinesthetics, and chin limb. Executive presence, as Alvin mentioned, communication skills, as Alvin mentioned. You know, the metrics of finances, as Alvin and I both mentioned together, that gravitas. And yes, it's all soft skills at this point. All soft skills. Yep. Praveen, Alvin can address this. Well, Alvin, I'm not sure if you're really how familiar you are with our world. What do big companies want coding skills, DS algorithm from a solution architect, big data and network security? Um, I know Praveen. Praveen is a big data architect and he's mm -hmm. real good at it. He's got great cloud architect skills and extremely good big data skills. Um, the architects that you send to customers that are selling product, are they coding? No. No, I've never seen an architect code in my entire life. Yeah. So I could tell a little bit about this. I can't relate it to big data, but we do have some coding skills that are required in data science. Um, data and the science. reason why we ask that for solution architect is because um, when you when you install, like, so we have a product called DGX. When you install the DGX, there's software containers that you have to download um, into the into the DGX for it to get to do the um, artificial intelligence setups. Um, so there's some required a little bit of coding for that. Um, so we look for Python coding predominantly uh, when we're doing that. Um, I can't speak to big data network security because I don't have a background there, but that's why we recommend it. It's just so we could do the setup of the initial um, implementation such that the customer can use the software packages accordingly. But um, you so have, and that's fair, you have some experience with Cisco. Did the network architects at Cisco code or no. the uh, security architects that are designing security yeah. solutions code? For or the most part, you're not going to see that ever from a solution architect perspective. It's rare. Now, when you're dealing with a data scientist, it's very different. Yeah. A data scientist has to aggregate data. So they need to know Python, Spark, and all these other tools. When you're doing the data scientist, there's these TensorFlow libraries, PyTorch libraries, and so many other things. Exactly. Those people, those data scientists, will be coding. Yeah, but a big, but a and and you could potentially be a big data architect. Might be a cross between an actual architect and an engineer in certain places where they're doing a little bit of both. But a true solution architect that you're working with, meaning the people that are going to go meet with somebody to talk about how they're going to change their business through, through uh, what do you call it? Through uh, artificial intelligence, through GPU computing, through data center technologies. Where are they working for you? The pre-sales side, the consulting side, or are they being the hands-on people that are doing it? Right. Um, so there's not, so repeat that last part, Mike, sorry. The architects that you work with in NVIDIA. Yeah. I mean, are they the people that are designing it or are they the people that are building it? Designing. Okay. Yeah, so. most of them are designed. So a lot of times the architect world, what they really do is they pull the solution together, right? So they'll look at, 
network components, security components, how your software packages work. And it's a lot of Visio diagramming and, and talking through it, but it's not the actual coding of it itself. Usually those are implementation engineering, right? Which exactly. And that's what I call them as implementation engineers. We design it. Once the design is done, yeah, we hand it over to the people to go build it. They're engineers. And when Correct. they're done, they hand it to the maintenance people, which are the sysop people. Exactly. So, um, uh, Chris, I, you see you have another question. Before we post the next question, Chris, I'm going to ask people to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Forward this to other people and type cloud hired in the window if you're having fun. Um, I done my YouTube algorithm work. Uh, Chris, bring up the next question. Sinisa, Alvin and Mike, your philosophy on work and life is so real and boosting. All kudos. However, I'm wondering how much of that philosophy is present in corporate North America these days. Thank you. Yeah, I, I still think uh, I still think it's present, right? Um, it just depends on the company that you work for. And this ties back into culture, right, of, of a certain company. Um, and so I, I, I think it's definitely present. I mean, I think there was opportunities like when Mike and I were going through the ranks and I talked about market transitions where we were able to capitalize on some of the market transitions. Um, but I do think now when I look at what the stuff Mike's doing with cloud and artificial intelligence ML, as I mentioned, there's definitely going to be that opportunity across multiple corporate Americas and not just in IT guys. Um, we're talking to companies like Walmart, you know, gas stations, doctor offices that are now uh, adopting these new technologies. Um, and so there's opportunities all over the place. I have a friend that was in IT and now he's working for an accounting firm because they're doing an AI ML implementation in accounting. And I was surprised to find out that he left IT to go work in accounting because now the opportunities are becoming um, more broad in scope. Yeah, and what I'm noticing is because, well, right now, because the market has been a little on the rough side, but there's still so much technology advancement, to me, it's looking for people that have really good expertise in one thing. Who are the one, who's the one person I can add to my team that can make a big difference in my business? So, mm -hmm. oh, can, can Tor G say, this session is so good, I would leave 10 likes if possible. Thank you so much for participating. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Really grateful to have you here. Chris, if you'll bring up the next question. And yeah, as Chris says, please hit the like button. Help us out with our algorithm. Here we go. More GPUs in action. <laughs> That's right. So uh, so let's make sure we get to the to Adam say, would joining a startup learning everything be contradicting the idea of being focused on an expert or depth of field? No, I think there are two different things we're talking about here, right? So you could be an, so I'll give you an example. I'm a depth in field in my work, in, which is channels. But in channels, there's several elements of channels, right? There's like channel operations or channel marketing, et cetera. I don't have to be a resident expert in every single one of those. But what's key for me in my job is I understand everything in those different organizations. I am an expert in programs, rebates and incentives but I understand the elements of what marketing brings, how operations work, because they kind of tie hand in hand. You have to run a campaign, you have to build an incentive strategy, you have to enable the partner, and you have to have the operations to pay everything on the back end. So you don't have to be a, a so what I've done is I've hired an expert in marketing, I hired an expert in operations, I'm the program expert, and I kind of work with those guys, but I have enough knowledge being at a startup of how it all interworks together. When I worked at Cisco, I didn't gain that knowledge because everybody works in silos and they do handoffs. Um, and so I don't personally think it's contradictory. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it actually works really well when you're in depth in, in a certain area and then you can expand your horizons to other areas and, and get just about an inch deep with the other sites, just so you have the intelligence to know how it all works. Actually, I love that, Alvin. So what you really want to do is about 10 feet deep on the main things and at least an inch deep on something else. So I like to say for things that I don't know, I still learn a little. Yeah. I mean, I know what a DevOps pipeline is. I know what DevOps does. I understand the CI CD pipeline, how it can help a business. Now, and I'm familiar with the process. Now, I'm not going to become a DevOps engineer as an architect because I'm an architect, not a DevOps engineer. And I'm not going to learn the code. I'm not going to learn the DevOps tools, but I still need to know what it is. So be great at your thing. Be the best you can be. 
and know enough about the other things so you can integrate it together. But more importantly, build a network of great people. Find your Alvins. Find your tech professionals. Build them. Help them. Let them help you. Build a real relationship. And guess what? You'll have them forever. Yeah, Christian. absolutely. So from Barrow Engineer, there are so many data science machine learning programs out there. University accredited, some more expensive than others. Are there any other more programs you would recommend? So I'll I'm going to let you answer that first. Uh, uh, and I have my, okay, and then I'll answer it. Okay, so I will say this, Barrow Engineer, um, and I am not a data scientist, but I know somebody really good who can pop in and answer some of these questions. It's a world where you see mostly PhD mathematicians that then are starting to adopt data scientists with just a math background, specifically a statistic background. Now, I know a lot about these university programs, these master's degree programs. From a cloud architecture perspective, we take people that do the master's degree programs every day, and then we teach them how to be cloud architects. Because what's taught in school, and don't get me wrong, uh, Chris, Chris from my team has gone through a a really heavy duty uh, data science boot camp where he did day in data out uh, data science every day for like months and months on end. So, you know, there's that. I tend to believe that, you know, some of these programs that are taught by real experts and the key is finding them where people they actually teach you how to do the job is more important than some of these things in school. See, when you go to a university and I love universities, I've got a couple of master's degrees, but you know, when you go to a university, they're typically not the people that are working in the fields that are actually teaching it. Yeah. So from an architecture perspective, we need a theory of how the systems work. And in the school, they'll teach you the theory of how the systems work. But that hands-on what to do, that hands-on how to do it, you know, you're going to have to work a lot harder to get that. So if you do take a university program, and that's great, you get a fancy master's degree or a PhD along the way, make sure you're doing data science projects on the way. Buy yourself a server. I tell my students a 16 core server with 120 gigs of RAM and three drives and at least an NVMe drive. Take that server, pop a couple of GPUs in it and literally do lab after lab after lab after lab after lab. Write your code, test it, do it, do it, test it, do it, do it, test it, do it. So I'd say be great at what you have. Realize in school, they may teach you 10% of what you need for the job like certifications, but it's up to you to go get that 90% and there's nothing stopping you. Just do it. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, and to add on to what Mike is saying, like there's a like what you'll notice now, and it's it's a new trend, is a lot of universities are coming out with data science AI degrees now. You could be a data, you could get an MS in data science, right? And a master's in data science. Um, and I think what's gonna happen, you'll see over the next few years. Um, just like how Cisco developed the CCNA and then there's a lot of different learning experts on it, you are going to start to see more data science classes that are going to come out from, from uh, vendors. Um, and I know Mike's been working on some of those already. Um, so I think the, the key is that you really have to ask yourself a couple of questions. Number one, are you going to go back to school and, and take these classes um, is one question. And then secondarily, is what are the ancillary classes you could take, you know, through like a learning partner um, and investigate that, right? And those are those are uh, important things you have to figure out. But I think with 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 AI and and um, ML data science stuff, it's so at cutting edge right now that there's just not a lot of people doing it right yet, right right as of this moment, from what I could see. I I think that's a really great answer. It's kind of like networking. There were no universities that were teaching networking either. In fact, yeah. there's one in New Jersey, but other than that, there's no other t universities that actually teach networking in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. How about Go Marks? You guys are amazing. I went to specialize in blockchain and healthcare. I currently work at a hospital leading an EMR EHR. Should I sign up for your cloud architect course? Okay, so Abigail Marks, I think the key is to really figure out what you would like. If you would like to be a cloud architect, that focuses on solutions for healthcare? Then the answer is yes. Now as a cloud architect, and I come from a healthcare background, I was a nurse practitioner prior to moving in tech, I had my own office, and I spent a lot of time working in tech. When I worked at Cisco, I was the lead architect for all of healthcare, which was a huge division. So if you want to specialize in healthcare applications and healthcare things and healthcare workflows, I'd say that's a great thing. So what the architect would do, Abigail Marks, is as follows. We would think about what do the nurses do? How are they moving around the unit? 
what gets in the way, what impedes them. For example, I did a, I did a, a consultation with a hospital and I was trying to find the best technology. And in the process, we put pedometers on the nurses to try and see where they were walking. Would you believe I was able to save three miles of walking per nurse per week by having the hospital add a second ice machine? Just a second ice machine. Now look at it this way, 30 nurses in a unit, three hours per week, that's 90 hours. 50 hours, $50 an hour for the average nurse. 90 hours times $50, you can just think of how much money we freed up. By doing that, we found money for technology that could get the doctors and nurses communicating with each other much faster, and we did things. So if you want to be an expert on designing end-to-end -end solutions to help healthcare organizations operate more efficiently, that's what we do as a cloud architect. Now, if you want to specialize in blockchain, you got to realistically see what is the application of blockchain? What is blockchain trying to achieve? Blockchain is basically saying that I ordered a medication and that the medication that I can't, that gives me that non-repudiation after the fact. I can't say that I ordered four milligrams of morphine sulfate to the cancer patient because it's there and it's on the blockchain. Now, I've got a lot of blockchain background. I actually personally owned a very large blockchain data center in Kansas for a long period of time. So I love blockchain. But in this particular environment, we're teaching cloud architects. We're teaching people how to design the end-to-end -end systems there. Blockchain itself, and I'm not convinced that blockchain will be adopted in healthcare because there's other ways to provide to make sure that the user sent the information they receive. And I like it. Now, the why not so much blockchain in healthcare? What is blockchain different? Blockchain creates a distributed ledger. Normally speaking, the ledger is in the organization's database or the ledger is in the organization's EMR. If we're going to use blockchain, what we're going to do is we're basically going to take a transaction. We're going to hash it with a mathematical algorithm. Um, we're typically going to use some kind of encryption, whether it's AES-256 or SHA-256. We'll use something to create a hash. And then every time I prescribe something, it's going to be notified on the blockchain. I know of no healthcare organizations that are using blockchain. I know of no healthcare organizations that are considering adopting blockchain right now. And realistically speaking, the things that you're trying to achieve with blockchain can be achieved on the healthcare applications themselves. Mm -hmm. I see all these applications going cloud. I see many of these applications being outsourced. So I don't see anything going on in blockchain and going on in healthcare for the next 10 years. I do think there's lots of industrial applications for blockchain, cryptocurrencies, information that could be lost with regards to transport. But Abigail, we're talking about industries that are much, much, much more technology enabled than healthcare. Healthcare tech is about 15 years behind the rest of the industry. So if you wanted to really be able to design systems for cloud providers and really, really be able to do something to change lives, we could do that with our cloud architect career development course. But if your goal is blockchain, that's not our specialty. Now, Alvin, you may have, a, do you have any perspective here? No, I think you covered everything I would have said. So that's great, Mike. Thank you. Chris, if you want to bring up the next question, AFRI-P. Being a VP, what's your strategy to pick up projects that will help you improve your craft for the next role? Great question, AFRI-P. It's a fantastic question. Um, this one is interesting, right? Because one of the things you have to realize as a, as a vice president is you have to align to the overall company strategy, right? That's super, super critical. And it may sound like common sense, but believe it or not, when you get in big companies, it's not necessarily common sense because some VPs go off and create their own thing. It's not aligned to the core strategy of the company. So the first thing is, is I, I work with Jensen, our CEO, to make sure that we have our five strategies laid out or six strategies, whatever he decides. That's the first thing we have to do. The second thing is, is then I look to say, how could I grow that specific strategy and what could I do to make it come to fruition through our partners and through our resellers. And what that typically does is that creates a new project for me. And then I'll have to do additional new skill sets and learn that skill set. Um, for example, one of the things I want to work on is how to adopt cloud resellers um, that consult in the cloud for AWS and GCP. It's something we've never done before. So I actually am exploring and I'm interviewing CEOs now of those big, large cloud consulting companies and thinking of how do I, a strategy for how do I build a program? And I'm actually working with those reseller uh, companies and their CEOs to actually build a strategy together in conjunction with them. 
And so that actually is going to enhance my skill set because it's something I've never done before. Um, I'm working with the the CEOs of these partners who are best of breed and actually know the, the cloud business extremely well. And I will formulate a strategy that's going to help our company achieve its its goal and where it needs to ultimately go. So I think what happens is when these initiatives fall out, they naturally these projects can actually come about and then you can actually have the opportunity to grow. Alvin, I love the way you answered that. I think that's terrific. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I, I don't know how many questions you have time for, Alvin. I know uh, you're a pretty busy guy, so. Yeah, we can take a few more, a couple okay. more. CEO Trell, what is the typical career path for NVIDIA for architects? Yeah, so, so I say have... come in as an architect and where do we go from there? Great question. Yeah, so architects are very valuable people within our organization. Um, um, we call them solution architects. And I actually have two that work with me very closely. Uh, the typical career paths is you have um, the baseline architect, which could do the infrastructure, what I call infrastructure side. And then there's the growth path to the data center, data, data science architecture, right? Which is all the software capabilities and machine learning and everything like that. Um, so once you come in as a entry level uh, SA, what they typically do is they give you a lot of different just experiences. I'll let you work on distribution. Then they'll let you work on commercial accounts. Then you'll do enterprise accounts. And then eventually once you get a few like um, layers underneath you, then they'll put you on a specific, in a specific area. Uh, for example, let me say, oh, okay, now you're going to be the architect for global system integrators. Then once you get to your career path there, you can move up the ranks of the SA and on the infrastructure side, which is all the hardware side, and then move up the data science ranks as well. Um, and then after that, you go into the management side, right? Um, a lot of our architects love to stay architects. Um, they they just enjoy that business. Um, a lot of people like to stay on the individual contributor, and there's like a nice career path uh, through that. And CEO, Trell, I think that Alvin gave you a perfect example. I took the regular architect path, but I went down a different direction. I decided to be, instead of an architect on a technology, I decided to be to focus on healthcare because I could practice. So I took my architecture career to a industry architecture. And by doing that, I was more of an enterprise architect and that's another path. So you can go either way. Jesse Murdoch, great questions, everybody. Yeah, Jesse's really pretty terrific. Um, he's thinking some pretty questions. Jesse is actually 25 years old. Um, <laughs> these questions he's coming up with. Nice. Um, um, CEO Charles said, uh, Alvin, you answered his question. So thank you so much. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure on the clouds because I don't work in security. It hasn't, it's not my specialty to work on security. Um, so I don't know, Mike, if you have one on that, the quite answer on that one. Yeah. So I think I'll take the first half and I think we can both answer the second half. The yeah. first thing from the security perspective is I want someone that knows security. I mean, knows firewalls, knows policy, knows IDS, IPS systems, knows how to lock system down, knows authentication, authorization, accounting, encryption technologies, and a little bit of networking so they know what can filter. I'm also looking for deep knowledge of the cloud. But what's really would wow me, and then you know, Alvin can ask you what wows him. Yeah. I get well when I see someone with a level of expertise. I got wowed like when someone basically shows me they want to work. They're excited about the tech and they show me the things they've done on their own that are way above and beyond what other normal people would do. I look for people that have maybe had a struggle of something that have fought so hard to get past that struggle that shows me that they can do anything. And I look for people that are verbally agile, that communicate well and are emotionally intelligent because I work really hard to build my team. My team is my family and I can't bring anyone in that's not going to make the rest of the team better. So for me, that's what I'm looking for. What are those intangible qualities you're looking for that's going to wow you, uh, Alvin? Yeah, you know, some of what you said, I think one of them for me is drive and passion, right? It comes off in an interview, believe it or not. Like when I interviewed, um, the guy, some of the feedback I got is he said, wow, you're super passionate about what you do. And I tell them I am. I love my job and I love what I do, right? And I think passion is super important. I could tell you, in my career, I've hired probably about 50 people over the course of my career. And there has been times I didn't hire the smartest person. I hired somebody because I felt they had the drive and I felt they were humble 
and I felt they they were just easy to work with. It's the soft skills I was looking at, um, and I've taken I've I've done that of my hires. I, I remember distinctly three people that I've hired that I could have went with a better person that had more skills, certification, technical depth. And when I look at those three people today, they're all senior directors or vice presidents, right? And it's it's really just having that aptitude to learn, being um, passionate about it. You always have to have passion. And I think that's what ultimately will help you be successful in those roles. And having a manager that's willing to take that risk. I'm willing to take risk when I feel that I'm going to get a return out of it. Great perspective. I hired this guy. I call him Avi. That's not his real name. I remember interviewing, I was at MCI Worldcom, and I remember he comes in on the interview and he's like, I want to be a network architect. And I ask him a networking question. And he says, honestly, Mike, I've never worked in networking before, but I want to so badly. And I asked him a little bit about this. He said, Mike, I got to tell you, I've never worked in networking, but I want it more than anything. And I said, at this point, I want, all I care about is, can you learn? So I yeah. said, could you tell me something you have done? He's like, I've been working with Windows at the synagogue. I said, okay, tell me what you've done. And he's talking about domain authentication and quotas and users and I am. And I'm like, you understand Windows? He's like, oh, yeah. It's the only thing I can do right now. So all I do is read about it, learn about it. <laughs> and I asked him another question. And I said, and I said, okay, I'm going to hire you. And I remember going to my manager saying, we have to hire Avi. And my manager says, is Avi a good network engineer? I'm like, no, I got to teach him networking. And they're like, any other specialties? I said, yeah, Avi can't work past 2 p.m. on Fridays because he has to be home before sundown. And my manager says, so you want to hire someone that knows nothing, they can't work a full, full week. And I say, yes, because Avi's got a great attitude. Avi is now a CEO of an organization. He deploys Chromebooks to the developing world and gives technology to people that never would have had it. If I didn't take Avi, he never would have been there. But it was Avi's attitude, his yeah. passion, his love and desire and his attitude that made me say this. You know what? I've almost never hired the best technology professional. I've always hired the best person that I wanted on my team. They were always yeah. competent. They were usually competent, but I can teach competency. Yeah, you can. easily. Yeah. I can't teach someone to be great. I can't teach someone to be motivated. I can't teach someone this, the the warrior spirit, the kokoro, which is I don't stop until I hit my destination. And if I get stuck with a roadblock, I obliterate that roadblock. And I don't care if I have to stay up all night to obliterate that roadblock. Hey, wait, there's a new roadblock. Hit it with a tank. Wait, there's a new roadblock. Bring a wrecking ball. Move stuff out of the way. That's what I are. I hire people that will never quit until they win. Yeah, exactly. So, Mike, it's the top of the hour. Um, I have some closing thoughts for the group, if you're okay, okay with that. Thank you. Please share them. Yeah. So, guys, number one, Mike and I, we started on this same journey that you all did, right? Number one, make sure you keep doing what you're doing. Get your baseline foundations done. Understand the technology. Number two, make sure that you're building your network of people through LinkedIn, through people you meet at work. Take the time to take somebody to coffee. Understand what their roles are. Uh, understand um, just different roles within the organization because you may not stay a network architect. You may branch off like how Mike and I did and figure out you like something else that's better. Number three, get a mentor. Mentors are extremely important and make sure you have a good mentor, not somebody that's going to be just kind of hanging out and, you know, kind of say, okay, let's meet for coffee. Somebody that's really going to guide you. Right. And Mike and I, we take that stuff serious. We've done it for several people in our careers. And I think that's super important that you do that. Number four, be passionate. You, passion comes out in interviews. If you are out there, energetic and passionate, you are going to do really well and people are going to see that and it's going to resonate. Number five, when you're interviewing, make sure your resume is in top condition. Make sure that even if you're an introvert, make sure you practice to be an extrovert in the interview, right? Mike's an introvert, but when you see him speak, he's very passionate about what he does. You'll never be able to tell, but Mike's, Mike's a quiet guy in general. I've known him for a long time, right? And then the other thing is, do the diligence, come prepared, like make sure you get everybody's email, follow through with thank you letters on your email on uh, once you do the, your interviews. That's super important to do as well. I look for that. I look to say who's gone the extra mile, who's got letters of recommendation, who's prepared me and brought their resume, who's actually done all the uh, thank you letters and everything. And those are my five tips for you. If you can do those five things, I think you'll be very successful. 
Alvin, I think that is the best guidance you could have given everyone. It's true. I'm an introvert. You'd never know it because when I'm out in public, I have to be. So there's that. Go find that mentor, as Alvin told you. Go write that thank you note. He just told you he looks for the people that go above and beyond. The students in my program, I actually have them build their own clouds. Why would an ar me have a cloud architect build their own cloud? First, after you've built it, guess what? You know what a cloud is. But more importantly, when you go to the hiring manager and someone said, I did an AWS lab, and someone else says, I built a cloud. You know, who really stands out as the above and beyond? Alvin just told you to look for above and beyond. I told you the 10 things that employers look like. Going above and beyond is the tone of things. So Alvin, I am so thankful you were able to share that with this audience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank Ayu, you. Thank you so much. Um, Mandar, thank you so much. Jawad, thanks so much. Um, Jesse, thank yeah. you. Actually, Jesse's in San Francisco. Um, believe it or not, he's right near you, Alvin. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Mag is over in India. Wow, that was great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and Dara, uh, very surprised to know that he's in there, that I'm an introvert. <laughs> Can't believe this. That's totally true. <laughs> Harris, a, currently working, but having this in yours is very motivational. I'm so happy to hear that, Harris. Chin Chin, what a Chin Chin, a great guidance. Thank you so much, Mike and Alvin. I'm so thankful to have you here, Chin Chin. Chin Chin was so nice. I woke up on Guruji Day and I had a message from him, and it was the first message. And I've seen many more that other day, but it meant so much to me. Uh, I call you Evo, even though that's not your name. You have a great Greek name, which I wish I could speak to you in Greek. Uh, Alvin and Mike, thank you so much. Maiden, Ma uh, th thank you so much for attending. You're welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Derek Houston, a great student of mine. Thank you, Alvin and Mike, so informative, professional. Passionate yeah. about what you both do came across through the YouTube session. Derek, that's the key. When you love what you do, it's not work. And when it's not work to you and you're, you love it and you're good at it, people notice. When people notice, you rise. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Nick, you wouldn't have guessed that at all. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's what happens when you have your friends, your coaches, your mentors, the people that know you best. Things about you come out, and I'm so thankful Alvin was here. Shapur, Mr. Alvin DaCosta, it was a pleasure having you in this live session. Thank you very much, Mike, for this great live stream. I enjoyed it a lot. Shapur, thank so you. Happy you were here. Sure, it can't. Thank you so much. Bebita, thank you so much. Chin Lim, who's actually coming in here. I think he's in Australia but right now, but he's over in Asia in the middle of the night, and he's here. Adam Say is over in Asia. Great session. Thank you so much for Alvin for your input. Alvin, he's a young man that's staying up halfway through the night. Brandon awesome. Rowan, uh, thank you, Alvin and Mike. Alonzo Coleman, wow. Alvin, thank you for your wisdom, humility, and sharing your career journey. You truly inspire. Thank you also, Mike, for your passion in building such a phenomenal community. Yeah. Nick, thank awesome. you so much, Mike and Alvin. You're Leo Parati's wash hands, wash hands, wash hands. I love that. Yep, that's the way to stay healthy. <laughs> Mr. Lamin Jamin. Boy, that sounds like I should have a reggae song associated with that. I, I know. That's that the name. coolest name. Um, thank you so much. Ahmad, uh, it was so great to have you here. Thank you so much. Porsche, uh, thank you for the great session. Much appreciated. You're more than welcome. Abdal, thanks, Mike and Alvin, for this wonderful. Um, Dan Juma, Alvin's closing remark was motivational and inspiring. Thank you, Mike and Alvin. I agree. Alvin's closing remarks were exceptionally good. Ahmad Ak opening. That's why we're doing these things. John Ojo in the UK. Um, uh, thank you so much. Balwinder, thank you, Alvin and Mike. Um, Balwinder, amazing. Thank you so much. Joe Millen, who's actually over at Cisco. Thank you, Mike and Alvin. Great session. David Davies. Okay, excellent information, insights. Guys, thank you so much. Great session, and nice to meet you, Alvin and Mike, too. Yep. Inig Zhang, uh, also over in Asia. Thank you, Mike and Alvin. Up in the middle of the night listening. Um, Midin, thank you so much. Jeannie, awesome. Thank you. Jawad, have a great weekend. Appreciate your time and advice. Lady, um, uh, thank you, Mr. DaCosta. Uh, Karan, great session. Thank you. Carlos Ramirez, great session. Mike and Alvin, thank you. Ned Dinkins, great Great, great cut architect in America. You, thank you. Uh, GoPal eye opening session. Thanks, Mike and Alvin. Epsilon, Amiki here. Great to see you, Amika. Great session. Thank you. Fallaran, thank you, Mike and Alvin. Uh, Ike, our Isaac, thank you, Mike and Alvin. Augustino, so happy to see you here. Amazing session. Leo Prades is an introvert yourself. You think you have the best semester you can hope for. Thank you, Mike. I will try to do everything I can for you, um, Leo. Awesome. Oh, wait, I see Sujit here on this session. Sujita is a friend, an exceptionally incredible cut architect with a million and one years of experience. I'm grateful to see you. Chad Kramer, thank you. Have a wonderful weekend yourself as well. Awesome.
Great stuff, guys. Alvin, thank you again for coming on. You're more than welcome. It was welcome. so nice to speak to you. I feel 25 again. I feel like we're 25. You and I are going around doing our thing. <laughs> and I haven't felt this young or excited in so many years. You have no idea. I know. I know. And then when I'm out to Florida, buddy, we're going to take, we're going to go out. I'm going to meet up with you. We'll I do a nice steak dinner. Great. I need to see your beautiful little daughter who's no longer listening to the doodle bops yeah. and dancing to the doodle bops. I've seen how much she grows. She was amazing when she was young and I can't wait to see her now. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And best of luck to all of you guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Have a great and fabulous weekend. Thank you all. So nice to see you. All right. Dad's here. Bye. And Take care. Like I said, that's the one person on my team that's not afraid to tell me to stop. That's my chief operating officer, Chris Johnson. He's exceptional. I got him from another industry. I'm really lucky. I took that industry expertise and I said, would you please come work for me? That's what yeah. it takes to get people from other backgrounds to make you successful. Thanks for popping in, Chris. All right. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you All so right. much.